Commissioner Pat Gardner in Water Resource Management, and I will be your moderator today throughout the summit. I'm just going to go over a few ground rules today, though. It seems like you guys are all uh, aware of these rules these days because most of you came in, everyone was muted. So, but just just to kind of reiterate here, uh, there are a lot of people here today. So for optimal audio quality, please make sure that you are on mute at all times, except if you have been called on to ask your question out loud. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to type your question in the chat. We will do our best to answer all questions in the chat. Um, and depending on the time allowed and the makeup of each section, we do have question and answer segments throughout today's summit. So during those times, I will, I will direct you to raise your hands and then we will call on you to ask your question out loud, or you can still type it in the chat during those times as well. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our Assistant Commissioner for Watershed and Land Management, Katie Angarone, for our opening remarks. Katie? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth annual Harmful Algal Bloom Summit. We are proud to continue this tradition um, to bring everyone together to share knowledge, exchange new information, sometimes commiserate, if I'm being honest, um, and generally ensure that we are all in the know um, and that we all know that we're in it together. Every year, the number of attendees, I think, seems to grow. So if you're new to this forum, uh, welcome. We are glad that you're here. Uh, we first began coming together in 2019. Um, actually 2020, I take that back, after a really difficult summer in 2019 to discuss lessons learned and to spread awareness regarding the science of HAB detection, um, health impacts, prevention, and management. And the first summit was born of the governor's initiative to address HABs, which is a framework that we are still following and that we have found to be successful. So after four years, we are in no danger of running out of topics, unfortunately. So this year's focus, new challenges, lasting solutions, was selected with that in mind. As our climate continues to change, temperatures are increasing, precipitation patterns are, um, well, they're no longer happening in a discernible pattern. Uh, and as, as we find ourselves edging closer to drought at times, and then we find that we are catching up very quickly in short, extreme bursts of rainfall um, in really just one or two events, we find that um, our challenges keep coming as a result of that uh, that different pattern that we find ourselves in. So today we're gonna hear about last year's HAB season and the new challenges that it brought. We'll share our lessons learned, our data, and we'll hear about how others around the nation are faring. And I have um, also the great pleasure of hosting a panel of experts that will help us understand how we turn data into action through regulations, planning, and funding. And this panel will focus on everyday decisions that many of us make that impact water quality and how a watershed approach undertaken by all of us is the most powerful tool in our toolbox because it doesn't treat or mitigate HABs, it prevents them. And the watershed ap approach, we believe, is the path to a durable solution. So to help us understand why um, localized and sp a specific approach is necessary, we will also hear about three case studies where partners have undertaken or are undertaking the hard work of cause analysis. And finally, we'll, we will hear from DEP's expert team uh, who we retained to provide guidance and share their expertise on critical questions surrounding HAB response, like municipal lake management guidance. And last but certainly not least, we will hear about a new collaborative effort between state agencies to address environmental and public health issues led by the New Jersey Department of Agriculture. And we'll also hear from our um, agriculture colleagues, their perspective on HAB prevention, and we're delighted to have them today here. So much of the work we do here surrounding HABs is a genuine collaboration between several programs at DEP and certainly our external partners. But I want to take uh, just a quick minute to thank the members of our DEP Harmful Algal Bloom Task Force, who is made up of staff from around the department. Uh, in particular, on behalf of myself and my colleague, Assistant Commissioner Pat Gardner, who leads Watershed and Land Management's sister program, Water Resource Management, um, you'll, and you'll hear from her later today. I want to thank 
the HAB Summit Planning Committee, who works so hard to put this event together every year. Um, I can safely say that we wouldn't be here today if it were not for Jess Cobb, Chelsea Brook, Adriana Tapia Avila, Vic Peretti, and Dr. Rob Newby. So thanks, guys. All right, let's uh, settle in and prepare to hear a wealth of information on this challenging topic. I, for one, remain comforted looking at the number of attendees and the faces around today's summit. Um, and I know that my DEP colleagues are probably tired of hearing me say so, but the decisions about water quality are made by mayors, council members, open space committee members, commercial businesses, residents, shade tree commissioners, planners, contractors, water suppliers, wastewater experts, lake managers, environmental commissioners, health officers, farmers, public works officials, school districts, universities, and funders, just to name a few. Everyone has a role to play in water quality, even if they don't yet entirely understand it. That is my firm belief. So along those lines, we would love to ask you, the audience, to take a survey to help us understand who's in the room and who is not. I think Adriana, are you going to load that survey? Yeah, I can. I can present yes. the slide one sec. Thank you. So the survey link is in the chat. You can click on the link, and I'm going to start the session. Um, you can also use the QR code, or join by the web page and then the ID number. So I'm going to start the session now. Okay, so that link is live. You guys should be able to go ahead and either click on the chat or um, shoot your phone at the QR code and log on. So we see some folks already logging on to the poll. Thanks. And then as you are entering uh, your own um, who you are, we can you can also see who else is here today. So I think if you hit, oops. I agree that the link is just to view the results. Oh. <laughs> so. But I don't know who is who is entering all the results. <laughs> Somebody's yeah, got the right perhaps, link. Perhaps folks with using the QR code. That might be the more successful way to do it. OK, all right. So shoot your phone at the QR code, and we'll give you another minute to enter. <laughs> Apologies, folks. This is not um, this is a little outside of our wheelhouse for the everyday presentation. So thank you for bearing with us as we enter the world of of on <laughs> on the go live polling. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It is All entertaining right. to watch the results, though. And. All right, and then Adriana, you're going to announce when you close the poll. Yep, give it another okay. 10 seconds here. OK, the poll is now closed and I'll post the results in the chat. All right. So it looks like we did have quite a mix of folks. We have a bunch of uh, number one is other, which that's unfortunate. Apologies, guys. We didn't think well, about that. Wonder, I'm wondering if, if folks who clicked other want to want to put something in the chat um, as to yeah, what their field idea. is. That'd be great. Yeah, we got a lot of water systems, health officials, consultants, and then a bunch of others. So thank you guys for participating. And Adriana has shared the results in the chat if you want to take a closer look. Um, so 
first up, um, so we'll get started with our first session of the day, as Katie mentioned, is going to be the year in review, New Jersey and beyond. And our first presenter is Vic Peretti. He is the chief of the Bureau of Freshwater and Biological Monitoring, and he's going to be going through an overview of the 2022 HAB season um, from New Jersey. So go ahead, Vic. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, presentation is loading up. Um, uh, thanks for all. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Vic Freddy. I'm the Bureau Chief of Freshwater and Biological Monitoring, and we're tasked with sampling all the freshwater streams and lakes throughout the state. Uh, but we're also tasked with the HAB response throughout the state, and we also have a lab that does the uh, cellular analysis as well as the toxin analysis. And presentation is just about coming up. Okay. Yep, we can see your slides, Vic. Okay, great. Uh, so um, I'll give a short presentation on the 2022 HAB season, uh, in which we saw a record number of confirmed HABs. And we believe that the drought conditions um, and heat last year, uh, which are known variables in HAB production, were significant factors in, in the number of HABs last year. Uh, we've also faced some new challenges. Uh, we had significant HABs at streams uh, rather than just lakes last year. And we also had threats to drinking water sources. So we had to enhance our response actions and perform additional investigations rather than just the usual response. Um, we've also enhanced some of our uh, technology. Uh, John Abenamarco from our bureau is gonna provide an update on the use of our autonomous, autonomous surface vehicle that we purchased last year uh, after my presentation. So in 2022, we received reports of suspected HABs at 89 water bodies throughout the state. This is a 62% increase in reports of suspected HABs from 2021, and it's a 7% increase in reports from 2020, which uh, previous to last year was had the highest occurrence of suspected HAB reports as well as confirmed HABs. So this translated into HABs confirmed at 65 water bodies, uh, this is a 38% increase from the worst year again in 2020. And as compared to 2021, uh, confirmed HABs rose by 85% throughout the state. Uh, water bodies that have beach closures due to HABs remain relatively consistent over the last few years, as did HABs at drinking water sources. However, the severity of HABs at drinking water sources increased and we'll discuss this in greater detail later in the summit uh, with a uh, case study. This chart shows the number of sites sampled within those 89 water bodies investigated. Uh, this resulted in 322 site-specific postings, uh, 300, which means 322 individual sampling events. Uh, also, sites with warning alerts increase, uh, which is another factor indicating the severity of HABs. Uh, the warning is um, uh, the warning tier is between the threshold of two micrograms per liter of microcystin toxins. I'm sorry, the um, advisory level for microcystin toxins is two micrograms per liter. Uh, warning level is between 20 micrograms per liter and 2,000 micrograms per liter. So this, uh, again, warning level increased significantly in 2022. Uh, it also marked the, the highest occurrence of toxins to date throughout the state. In previous years, microcystin occurrence above the two micrograms per liter threshold was present in only about 50% or less of confirmed HAB samples. Uh, in 2022, that rose to 61%, uh, and again, the highest occurrence in the warning level to date at 13%. And a warning level recommends additional caution uh, from secondary contact like kayaking uh, rather than just caution uh, due to swimming. 
all of our data is on the HAB dashboard on our website. Um, it's an interactive map uh, with dots at the site sampled with the warning, uh, color coded with the warnings posted. Uh, so we'll, we're gonna clear this state dashboard uh, as of April 1st. Uh, so it'll be a, a blank map again. Uh, however, all the 2022 data and previous to 2022 is avail available on our searchable map, which is on our downloads page. Can it be accessed from the, the downloads page? Can be accessed from the map dashboard page? The map looks exactly exactly the same. Uh, you can search by uh, by the map by clicking on dots, or you could download a spreadsheet and filter it with the um, parameters that you want to look at. As far as the HAB strategy itself, uh, each year. We review the literature that's present uh, as far as HAB science. And for the upcoming year, 2023, uh, we found that the guidance and thresholds remain aligned with the current science. Uh, so there will be no changes to the strategy. Uh, the annual summary report, uh, which is a report of the previous years and a comparison to years, um, compares to that's a report on last year specifically, but it also compares to uh, previous years since the program was started in 2017. Uh, that will be posted in April. And it'll contain the uh, information and the graphs I just provided along with a lot more detail. Uh, so even though we review the, uh, the strategy and the um, literature and the science behind the uh, uh, HABs and the thresholds. Uh, we also look at New Jersey specific data each year. Um, so um, the bathing beach closure is what we're most looking at as far as uh, cell counts that are appropriate for beach closings if there are no toxins present or cell counts that the potential for toxins increases. Uh, so using current data up to uh, 2022, uh, the bathing beach closing threshold for cell count versus the toxin uh, remains the same at 80,000. Uh, and you see by this, uh, this graph, uh, 80,000 cells per mil is when the potential for toxins significantly increase. So that uh, beach closing, closing threshold uh, will remain this year based on all available data for New Jersey. Um, and this year, as I said, drinking water concerns became a significant issue, uh, as well as habs and streams. Uh, so streams, unlike a lake, could have multiple sources uh, far away upstream from the, where the actual hab is occurring. And it can have multiple sources of nutrients that feed the hab. Um, so in past years, habs were linked to stormwater or land runoff. Uh, this year, we had a uh, severe drought conditions, so runoff was a mi minimal factor. We had to pivot our thinking on tracking the potential cause of a HAB, uh, including looking at point source discharges and also stream flow condition. Uh, to address these new challenges, we performed source trackdown investigations to identify potential sources of nutrients feeding HAB. Uh, we collaborated and coordinated with many new agencies, including drinking water purveyors and discharge permittees. And again, we have a case study that I'll summarize later in the, in the summit. Uh, we also enhanced our lab capacity for finished drinking water analysis. We're certified for microassisted analysis in both surface water and finished drinking water. Uh, and it becomes important, especially for drinking water, our lab has about a 24 hour turnaround time for, um, from sampling to completed analysis. So we're able to give purveyors uh, when necessary, you know, almost immediate results on the microsystems and finished drinking water. And again, we continue to enhance our program with new technology. Uh, John's gonna present our uh, autonomous, autonomous surface vehicle. I'll get that right one of these days. Uh, to characterize uh, the HABs and water quality uh, for an entire lake. Our buoy system is up and running at 
full capacity, and that's uh, real-time telemetry buoys. Uh, we're currently deploying them. They'll be uh, ready for the summer season. Uh, come Memorial Day weekend, uh, our flyover program uh, will be in full force. That's another source of information that we could uh, uh, surveil halves as they happen. And lastly, I just want to um, acknowledge our bureau. Uh, we, uh, uh, our, our staff, uh, based on our HAB work and our HAB technology, uh, won the North American Lake Management Society Award for Advanced Advancement in Lake Management Technologies. And you know, that's mainly due to the hard work uh, of our staff and you know, also their willingness to try new things try new technology, um, and I really want to give a good shout out to our staff. Uh, they really deserve this, um, so I want to thank them also. And there's my contact information. Um, if there's any quick questions before I hand it off to John, I'll be glad to answer some. Thanks, Vic. Lots of good work happening. Uh, we do have time for a question or two. If anybody has any questions for Vic, you did get a couple questions in the chat, which Rob has okay. cleared up on basically identifying or the, the presumed HABs that then you confirmed weren't HABs. And that's why the number of reported HABs is a little higher. And then also, do we think that the um, increase in HABs is also a result of increased education and um, identification tools, which Rob has answered in the chat for us. So, okay. but if anybody else has any questions, you can raise raise your hand at this point. And we can also take a few questions at the end of this session as well. So um, with that, thanks, Vic. And at this point, I am going to turn it over to John Abeto Marco, who is also in the Bureau of Freshwater and Biological Monitoring, and he is going to be presenting on the High Cat Autonomous Surface Vehicle. Go ahead, John. Thank you. And we can see your slides. Excellent. <laughs> OK, good morning. I'm John Abadamarco, as you heard, from the Bureau of Freshwater and Biological Monitoring. I currently work on the HAB Buoy Continuous Monitoring Program and the new HICAT project. The HICAT is an Autonomous Surface Vehicle, or ASV. This is our newest tool for monitoring HABs in New Jersey. 2023 will be our first season deploying the HICAT for monitoring. We spent the last few months training a team and rigorously testing the vehicle to get it ready for the season. I'm excited to show you what the HICAT can do and how we plan to use it this year as a complement to the continuous monitoring program. The HICAT uses a shortened version of our multi-parameter sonde in the monitoring buoys. Currently, we're using the same probe array found in our monitoring buoys. This includes ODO percent, ODO concentration, specific conductivity, pH, phycocyanin, temperature, and turbidity. Unlike the buoys, the HICAT can collect the data across an entire water body. As the HICAT is running, it also utilizes a multi-beam river surveyor and side scan sonar to produce detailed bathymetric maps and high resolution imaging of the bottom. All of this is visible to the operators in real time through a portable base station. The HICAT does not just collect data. With its onboard computer and powerful software, the data can be processed on site. We can produce heat maps for the individual water quality parameters in just a few minutes. These heat maps let us see the water quality on the water body in an easy to read graphical map. We are also able to produce accurate bathymetric maps. Bathymetric maps are not new to our Bureau. We have been mapping water bodies across the state pretty regularly for the past few years. The process involves taking out a boat or boats, recording the data, then uploading that data to a vendor and waiting for them to process it for us. The HICAT eliminates the need for outside processing. We can process the data immediately and produce maps on the spot. But it's not just bathymetric maps. The side scan sonar data can also be utilized to show sonar image of the entire bottom. Here I have a couple of maps we produced last week on Spruce Run Reservoir. We ran the HICAT from the right side of the map to the left, which took about an hour and a half. 
The morning was cloudy when deployed and became clear and sunny by the time we finished. Top map shows ODO percent from the State Park Beach. It might be hard to see the legend in this small format, but the scale goes from the pink color, which is around 100%, to the bright red at 105%. The bottom map shows bathymetry in feet for the cove. The scale of this map goes from orange at about under a foot to pink, which is just under 21 feet. The water level was lower at the time of the aerial photo shows, which explains the gap in data around the shoreline. Deployments. The HiCat is an electric boat that can run all day on rechargeable battery power. The base station is powered by lithium power packs that can be supplemented with a small solar array if needed. This allows us to run the HiCat all day without the range anxiety normally associated with electric vehicles. We have enough power on tap to run multiple monitors, laptops, and Wi-Fi. This gives us the ability to go to almost anywhere in the state and not have to worry about having enough power for the mission. This is how we plan to use the HiCat this year. Our plan is to deploy the HiCat three times per year at six of the 11 buoy locations around the state. Those locations are Greenwich Lake in Gloucester County, Lake Lenape in Atlantic County, Spruce Run Reservoir in Hunterton County, Bud Lake in Morris County, and Swartzwood Lake in Sussex County. Due to the size and complexities of Spruce Run and Swartzwood Lake, we'll only be sampling the areas near the buoys and other select areas as needed. Lake Apatkong and Greedwood Lake will not be sampled this year because of the amount of recreational boaters that utilize those two water bodies. This is for safety reasons and honestly our lack of experience with this new tool. After this season, we will reconsider deploying to those locations if we are confident it can be done safely. And this new tool doesn't have to be limited to only HAB work. We can do river work. The river survey on the HICAT can measure velocity. This means we can deploy the HICAT in navigable rivers and streams. And this can be done without having to put staff in the water or on larger unweightable rivers. So river work makes sense. Emergency deployments. No prior planning is necessary to run a mission. We can set up the base station, create a plan, and get the boat in the water in under an hour. So if we can get to the body of water, and if it's navigable, we can sample it. And other water quality parameters. We currently have space to hold two more probes in our sond, and the existing probes can be easily swapped out. So we have the ability to do much more if needed. I hope everyone is excited as we are about the high cat, and we can't wait to show everyone what we're able to accomplish this season at the 2024 HAB Summit. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was fascinating. Um, so we do have a couple questions in the chat. Um, Vic answered one on the ability of the high cat to collect surface data versus um, vertical data. Um, and there was a question about is there a scheduled day for Bud Lake or is that just on the on the books for at some point? I assume that has not been scheduled that far out yet. No, that hasn't been scheduled yet, but it'll be coming up soon. OK, and then someone asked, how much does the high cat cost? A lot. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's depending on like uh, it includes training. It depends on what um, uh, sensors you, you, you buy. Um, can we offer it's, a range you know, fit? Yeah, it, it's a range. Um, it's in a hundred and fifty thousand dollar range. Okay. All right. Um, one more question. I assume the high cat relies on its fluor fluorometer to monitor HABs. It has the same probe as in our uh, that's in our buoys, and we also use in all of our handheld meters now. So it measures phycocyanin, and it also has the, the ability to uh, measure chlorophyll A. Okay, we have 
they, they keep coming, so hang hang with me here for a minute, John. Um, yeah. Are the computations or estimates that are applied to the unnavigable areas, or are there computations um, that apply to the not unnavigable areas? And curious about the buffers in the areas being weighted near the banks. This is multi multi tiered question. Also well, curious yes. about the compensation uh, for surface disturbance caused by the propulsion. OK, go for it. <laughs> OK, let me let me try. This is still very new to us, but. Uh, it does, it is able to work out the shallower areas that it can't reach. We can get into about six to eight inches of water with it and still read the bottom, so it doesn't have a lot to. Work out. Um, what it does is as it's making a pass, I know you saw in that original video, it was kind of bouncing around as it was making its turn. It's not reading there. What it's doing is it's re it's turning around and getting back online. And by the time it seems to get back online with the stability of the boat, the surface disturbance really isn't uh, a factor. OK, thanks so much, John. Um, and to round out this session, our, our last presenter is Dr. Fred Lubnow, who is the Senior Director of the Ecological Services at Princeton Hydro, and he's going to be talking about HABs around the nation. So, Fred? All right, thank you. Um, first, can everyone hear me? Can hear you. We can okay. hear you. I don't see any slides yet, but I'll let you know. Yep. Okay. We see your slides in regular mode, not presentation yes. mode. Uh, there we go. How's that? There you go. All right, excellent. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you. I'm really excited to be participating in this uh, session. Um, oh, uh, so can I, I, I heard something strange. Can everyone hear me? I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. We can hear you. Um, your slides look a little condensed, but I think we can probably see for the most part, they look a little cut off at the ends, but I, I huh. think it it might be OK. OK, all right. Um, I'll let you know if there's any. Oh, yeah, they're a little cut off at the ends. Huh, that's strange. I don't know why. Or am uh, I the only one having that problem? <laughs> no, you are not. OK. It, how, how does that look? Is that I mean, even though it's not the formal. If you can recenter it, it's like push it over to the left side of your screen push it over to the left a little bit and then there you go yep that's fine we okay can see that's fine great <laughs> thank you um so yeah I, i'm going to be talking about habs um throughout the nation a little bit and as well as regionally uh, i did want to talk uh, real briefly about the national lake assessment which uh the report came out last year uh, and I did want to identify that, um, you know, the, the last National Lake Assessment that was conducted in 2017 identified that 45% of lakes are in poor condition relative to elevated phosphorus and 46% are in poor condition relative to elevated nitrogen. Um, and that uh, higher levels of algal control or lower, lower water clarity uh, is increasing or have been observed in 24% of the nation's lakes. Uh, in a, in addition to that, um, microcystins were detected in 21% uh, percent of the surveyed lakes, and um, the lakes were considered poor relative to biological ind indicators in 24%. So this is, you know, HABs and other uh, problems are prevalent in our lakes throughout the nation. Uh, there's also been some economic impacts. Uh, one study identified that excess phosphorus uh, results in 0.4 to up to 3.3% decrease in lakefront housing prices and then the presence of algal toxins can negatively affect property values from 2 to 17 percent. Uh, but I do want to identify that the Clean Lakes program, which currently has no funding, uh, when it was uh, um, funded, it spent over its life uh, $9.5 million, but it's been estimated to achieve uh, $90 million in return on investment. Um, and uh, to dovetail on that, if, if anyone's familiar with the study that was recently presented by the University of Delaware, um, that the New Jersey tributaries uh, for the Delaware River watershed economically been estimated to tr uh, contribute 1.6 to 2.3 billion dollars annually. So HABs do have a direct impact not only on our 
health and our environment, but also on our, our local and regional economy. And I do want to give a quick plug here that um, I'm a member of the um, uh, Section 314 Committee for the North American Lake Management Society. Um, 314 was that part of the Clean Water Act that was included clean lakes. And as a committee, we're working um, with uh, various organizations and legislators to reinstate funding into the Clean Lakes Program. And the key uh, identifying points we're focusing on, number one is HABs, number two is invasive species, three is impacts of climate change on lakes, um, four is preservation and protection of sensitive lakes, and then uh, five is environmental justice for lake users, particularly in very urban areas where you have a lot of small shallow water bodies that are used for a wide variety of recreational activities. So I'm mentioning that because over the next few months, uh, NOMS will be uh, putting out information, uh, asking people to contact their legislators, asking people to uh, check on the website on our progress. We're really, this is a long-term goal of us to reinstate funding for the Clean Lakes program. Um, so I'm gonna move into more of the presentation associated with HABs. Uh, I'm gonna very briefly talk about Lake Apacon. I always have to talk about Lake Apacon. This is just listing some of the projects and programs that we're working on on Lake Apacon. Um, I do wanna show this, that um, when we look at our surface water, total phosphorus concentrations, and this, this includes 2022, um, the surface water concentration concentrations in general have been declining over the decades thanks to all the watershed, stormwater, uh, septic management efforts that have been going on in the watershed. However, we have seen over the decades an increase in the deep water total phosphorus concentrations. And um, this is at least partially, if not mo mostly associated with climate change. We've seen higher concentrations, higher volumes, higher areas of anoxic areas, in the deep waters that contribute to releasing phosphorus from the sediments. Uh, and I always like to show this, this is showing our continuing trend of increasing surface water temperatures at Lake Apacon during the month of July. Uh, note 2018 was a fairly cool year. Um, and that year was not a bad year for HABs. The following year was 2019 when we had a lot of problems, but look at 2019, 2020 and 2022 were all above that trend line in terms of being warm. They were very warm. And that was before we hit August and September when we had very dry and very warm conditions uh, in the region. And we're, you know, the phosphorus concentrations in June, which really triggered the HABs in 2019, uh, we, were, we were below the 0 0.04 milligrams per liter that triggered the HABs in 2019. But in 2022, we were still above our targeted TMDL goal, which is to keep that average concentration at or below 0 0.03 milligrams per liter. Uh, the one thing I want to emphasize with a pack on is um, what we've learned over the last three, four years is the 2019 uh, HAB event was a one-two punch. It was the watershed sources, stormwater, septic leachate that triggered the HABs, but it was the internal phosphorus that really allowed those HABs to continue through the, the entire growing season. And indeed, when we look at the common cyanobacteria in Lake Apacon, um, many of them have gas vacuoles, which allows them to move up and down the water column, fuel up on the deep water phosphorus, and then come up to the surface to photosynthesize. Um, this has had a long, th this has had a, um, a, a long-standing effect on the lake, uh, not just relative to HABs, but what we've seen is, if you look at water clarity in that first half of the growing season, when, when aquatic vegetation is really taking root, prior to 2019, our average Saki depths in the mid-lake was greater than two meters. But it seems like once we had the HAB event in 2019, typically our, our Saki depths um, in the first half of the growing season are less than two meters. And this has had a big impact on the entire ecosystem. So if we look, we don't do plant surveys on a regular basis, but we do have some pretty good weed harvesting records. So if you look at prior to 2019, uh, we were harvesting a fair amount of vegetation, uh, uh, removing up to eight to nine percent of the phosphorus being targeted under the TMDL. But once 2019 hit, we've been removing very, we've been removing smaller amounts of weeds, and it's just because the weed growth isn't as high as it used to be. 
And this is directly related to the halves, that when you have more algae in the water column, uh, there's less light getting to the sediments and less plants. And I'm really advocating and pushing that we want to go back to the good old days where we're complaining about plants. We were complaining about weeds, not complaining about halves, because the plants are easier to manage. They don't produce cyanotoxins. And we have that harvesting program that was you know, very effective you know, prior to the HAB events. Um, this is just showing you the vertical profiles of, of Lake Apacon, just to emphasize that during the summer, if you look at that graph to the right, we have a depletion of dissolved oxygen in those deep waters, and that really helps to promote cyanobacteria growth. I'm going to compare this to Harvey's Lake, which is in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. It's one of the largest natural lakes in Pennsylvania. And if you look at its vertical profile, it actually has oxygen all the way to the bottom. And this is primarily due to uh, having 60% of its hydrologic load coming from groundwater. Uh, it has a TMDL, and we have focused on a wide variety of watershed projects. Uh, we've successfully got our phosphorus below that TSI, which stands for um, trophic state index. We got it below 50. The only time it went above 50, it hit 51 in 2019. Uh, so Harvey's Lake typically does not have HABs, but what, what was strange in Harvey's Lake's case is in mid-October of last year, and remember, we had a very dry, very warm summer going into fall. Um, we had a HAB, a, a near shore HAB event, and phosphorus concentrations were low. They were at 0 0.01 milligram per liter. It was not associated with a storm event, but we had cell counts, you know, varying between nine and 48,000 cells per mil. And this was very odd, especially in mid-October. Um, and when, when Pennsylvania uses the, e, the EPA criteria um, for recreational water bodies, I mean, it was in that moderate range which is, you know, cyanobacteria cells between 20 and 100,000, uh, where it's that moderate level of concern. So, and, and this, this, you know, correlates similar to what New Jersey uses for their recreational water bodies. Um, and so these near shore cyanobacteria were ones that have what are called aconites, um, which aconites are these resting spores. Uh, and they can be really problematic. And something that we've been seeing and, and you know, listening to various um, researchers and going to various conferences, uh, and Vic touched on this, that, you know, where are these cyanobacteria coming from if we're not having a lot of uh, inflow coming in generating this growth? Well, it turns out even planktonic algae, a lot of them start in the sediments, in nearshore sediments. Uh, and in those nearshore sediment areas, even though above the water, you have 0 0.01 milligram per liter. When you're at that sediment inter interface, there's a lot more nutrients to harvest. And so these aconites, which are these resting spores, um, they, they, tend to be, they tend to form in low temperatures or when the water body is drying out, but they're viable for up to 70 years. And they may be lying in the sediments just waiting to grow. And that's what we're starting to look into for some of these lakes. Uh, but in addition to these resting spores, we have seen in other lakes, like in the case in, of Lake Mohawk, I'd say about maybe 10 years ago when we were battling some microcystis, microcystis doesn't form these aconites, but it can overwinter um, as these vegetative colonies. So, you know, we're looking into the possibility of, um, you know, sam we're sampling sediments and looking to see how these aconites um, are are having this effect. And what's interesting is um, under anoxic conditions, most of these cyanobacteria um, will, will hatch from these aconites. Uh, and obviously climate change is having a huge impact on it. Now, when you, when you hear presentations and, and when I've been reading some papers, it's really not climate change that is triggering the HABs. The climate change makes the conditions more conducive for the HABs. So this one quote was, in one study, ultimately nutrients are more important predictor of cyanobacterial biovolume. And what's interesting, too, is it's nitrogen and phosphorus that's important. So phosphorus really drives the cyanobacteria growth. But what we've been seeing is nitrogen very frequently will, 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 uh, will allow the cyanobacteria to produce the um, cyanotoxins, in particularly microcystis, that it has needs a lot of nitrogen, um, needs a lot of nitrogen uh, elements. So uh, very frequently, I've seen a lot of studies to show that while you know more phosphorus, more cyanobacteria, 
But if you have these pulses of ammonia or nitrate or even organic forms of nitrogen, they can trigger the production of cyanotoxins. And I just want to emphasize that this winter we just came off of was very mild. This is Lake Apacon in January and February of this year. This is Harvey's Lake over late February. Normally, these lakes are frozen uh, with ice and snow on them. And so we're very concerned what this year is going to hold. I mean, some of our central Jersey lakes already have some blooms. We can see some curly leaf pondweed growing. It's really going to be dependent on what this year is like. If we have a cool, wet year, we may not have a lot of issues with HABs, but it could be problematic if we have another dry year. Um, climate change also has an impact on invasive plants, but we also found an invasive cyanobacteria in um, Lake Apacon this year, uh, a species of Cylindrospermopsis, which is normally a tropical um, species. Um, we first observed it last year in July and August, and then it was gone. It has heterocysts, which means it can fix nitrogen, and it has gas vacuoles, so it can move up and down the water column. Um, so we're looking at how to manage these benthic sources of HABs. And there are a number of ways. Um, I've shown in the past how we've done some shallow, um, tr shallow water treatments for nutrient inactivation, which um, limits the amount of available phosphorus, but also there's the supersaturation at the water sediment interface to oxidize those sediments, um, which is a, a sort of a higher form of aeration. And again, I, I'm not going to get into these. I've talked about these before. Um, but one thing I do want to touch on is um, I've we've used biochar, and this year we last year we used it in um, Duke Farms, uh, the ecological preserve. We put it in this small mermaid pool, which is very convenient. It has one inlet, one outlet, and I just wanted to share this data that if you look toward the second half of the summer season, um, we were getting some good removal rates with the biochar. Um, so if you have low nutrient concentrations, you can see. You don't have a high removal rate, but once we got in where we were having higher phosphorus concentrations, we were having some beneficial use. Um, again, we're looking into oxygenation, um, uh, talking with Paul Ganser, and I just wanted to mention one of these side stream saturation systems was just installed in uh, Culver Lake last year. So we're, we'll, we'll be working with Steve Souza and Culver Lake and monitoring to see how effective that system is, not only at you know oxygenating those sediments, but what are we doing to those aconites? Are we seeing a reduction in those aconites? Um, so, I, you know, just a few recommendations. You know, vertical monitoring. I, you know, the the high cat is excellent, and I see that being an extremely useful tool. But again, you need to know also what's going on in in, in the, through the water column. You know, sampling through the high summer season is very important, but we may need to start looking into fall and even early winter. Uh, keep in mind that nitrogen and phosphorus are very important. And I know Jason will be talking about that with Deal Lake. Um, microcystins tend to be produced by planktonic genera, where anatoxin A tends to be produced by benthic genera. That's something we're looking into and how that impacts the generation of these aconites producing blooms. And I want to finish with, uh, and again, Vic mentioned river, um, river habs. You know, like he said, late summer was very dry. We had very low water levels, and we actually did some sampling in the Delaware for cyanobacteria. I just wanted to show the, the gauge height that at one point when the gauge height in the Delaware River at Trenton was, you know, about eight, we had 36,000 cyanobacteria cells per mil. Um, once that water level increased due to storms, you can see how it declined. But again, this is something that we may have to seriously consider during climate change events or during low events we may also have um, these HABs impacting riverine systems. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of time left, but I did want to mention, you know, um, uh, Graham and others have done some really good work, USGS, assessing river HABs. You know, I will share that um, with everyone if you want later on. But really, uh, what I wanted to emphasize with their studies is, while they did not find cyanotoxins in the river samples that they collected over 2017 through 2019, they did find cyanobacteria in there, and they did find the genes that produce many of these cyano cyanotoxins. So basically what that's telling us is these river systems, and this study included the Delaware River, they have the potential to produce cyanotoxins. And how will climate change impact that? And if there's an increase in nitrogen, will that trigger that? 
So again, um, something to consider, and I know Vic will be talking about the Millstone River, um, uh, just a shot of that. Uh, so again, we're looking at, you know, to wrap up here, we're looking at um, the impact of HABs on rivers. Um, we're developing a type of uh, methodology or sampling program uh, that will in include remote sensing and some drones. Um, but again, Vic touched on this, that, you know, where, where are these HABs coming from? Are they coming from the river themselves or are impoundments batch incubators? And if, it's, if that's the case, for some of the small impoundments, it lends more credence to dam removal. Dam removal, you know, is, is done for fish passage, for hydrological improvements, but it may also be a way of eliminating a source of HABs. Uh, so in conclusion, climate change will certainly contribute to the HAB events. Um, monitoring is key. We may have to expand monitoring beyond the summer to get a good handle on the interactions of the watershed relative to the HABs. Um, considering the collection of benthic samples, I know we're going to be focusing on that. Uh, looking at watershed measures that not only focus on phosphorus, but also nitrogen. And again, this leads credence to green infrastructure because green infrastructure is far more effective at removing nitrogen and phosphorus than some of the more, you know, gray infrastructure. And then finally, you know, please support North American Lake Management Society as, as we start rolling out uh, information on reinstating the Clean Lakes program. So I thank you for your time. Thanks, Fred. That was a lot of really great information. Um, so you have generated quite a few questions in the chat here, so I'm going to try to get to those first. Um, did the seasonal lake turnover happen to coincide with the event at Harvey's Lake? So going back to. Uh, no, it didn't. Uh, and it was because it was it was a very warm year. So the, the lake was actually still thermally stratified. But again, remember at Harvey's, we don't have a lot of phosphorus down there like we do at Lake Apacon. So very frequently when you do have that turnover, if you have a lot of rich nutrients, that will trigger a fall bloom. And we normally don't see a fall bloom at, at Harvey's because they don't have a lot of nutrients down there. Thanks. Um, and then what are the theories on how tropical cyanobacteria would get here? I mean, um, the thing about cyanobacteria is they're, they're very cosmopolitan. So they're very global. You, they're they're all over the earth. They they can they can move in the atmosphere. They can be attached onto waterfowl. So it's very easy for them to move. I think what's telling about the the species of Cylindrospermopsis is that it um, it typically is tropical, and that over the years, and if you look in the literature, it has been popping up more and more in temperate areas. So it was just strange that we saw it in a pacon, and we've been looking at the phytoplankton in Lake Apacon for the last 30 years. This is the first time we have seen it in the lake. So it's just interesting that as we see the temperature of Lake Apacon rise, this is the first time we've seen. And not only was it there, it was there. It was, it was the dominant cyanobacteria in July and August. And then by October, early October, it was gone. Okay, fascinating. <laughs> Uh, and then one more, was the biochar effective at removing nitrogen as well as phosphorus? That's a really good question, and that's actually what we're going to start looking into this year. So I know as part of the uh, Lake Apacons Lake Restoration Grant, uh, we'll be using biochar. Um, we're going to be evaluating nitrogen, and then we have some other projects for shore, shore lakes where we want to use the biochar. And again, those shore lakes, and, and Jason's going to talk about this, um, those shore lakes, nitrogen is even more important. Uh, and I know, you know, for some of our shore lake projects, we want to evaluate how effective it is at removing nitrogen as well as phosphorus. Okay, and then someone asked if there are, are there lasting effects of um, PAHs surrounding the soils um, due to using biochar? Are you seeing, does, is that a concern when using biochar? Or is it contained within the unit? No, it's, it's supposed to be contained within, but again, what we want to do is we want to um, take some biochar after it's been in a lake for three months, six months, and we want to do a full analysis of it, of, of, like a soil analysis, thinking of it as a non-structural fill. Could you, you, you know, would this fall under clean fill? So again, this question is coming up a lot. So we're designing some monitoring this year where we're going to take some samples after they've been in the lake for three or six months and run them like we're doing a, a like we're doing a dredging analysis and how you evaluate dredge to see if that sediment can be used as non-structural fill. We want to do the same thing with biochar. Um, I had a conversation with someone with e from EPA who 
said if an or if, if someone who was not the biochar company did a study like this, EPA would really appreciate that because it would be a third party investigation. So um, we're, we're, we're looking for funds to do this. And so I, I think we will be able to do that this year. Sounds good. Um, all right. I think we have time for just one or two more. Um, do you have actual numerical limits for nitrogen and phosphorus? At what limits of nitrogen and phosphorus are you low versus high risk of blooms um, when you're considering? Yeah, so um, so the analytical lab we use can get down to that 0 0.01 milligram per liter, which is great. Um, if you get phosphorus as high as 0 0.03 milligrams per liter, that can potentially trigger a bloom. Uh, the state's criteria is 0 0.05 milligrams per liter, which is actually a good threshold because what we've seen is usually when you hit 0 0.06 milligrams per liter, you're either in a bloom or you're going to have a bloom. So that that 0 0.05 state criteria is a pretty good criteria to have. Now that's for all lakes, but certain lakes are more sensitive. So under their TMDL, for example, for Greenwood Lake and Lake Apacon, we have it set at 0 0.03. So we're trying to keep the average concentration over the growing season at 0 0.03 milligrams per liter or lower. Good. Um, and let's see, what is, oh, do one more, what is the driving, what is driving increased interest in nitrogen? Yeah, so um, so two things. One is what they have found, is, even if you have cyanobacteria that can fix their own nitrogen. And see, the idea is a lot of cyanobacteria can fix nitrogen. So the original thought was, well, nitrogen isn't that important. It's really phosphorus that drives their growth because they need a lot of phosphorus so that they can fix nitrogen. That's true, but if the cyanobacteria are given nitrogen, they're not going to fix night, they're not going to fix the nitrogen because it's a very uh, energy dependent process. So they're going to be lazy. If there's more nitrogen, they're going to take up that nitrogen. And the thing is, taking up that nitrogen, there have been a lot of studies to show that triggers in a lot of cases cyanotoxins. So that's the uh, that's really the, the crux of, of the interest in freshwater systems with nitrogen is hey. If you're adding more nitrogen, um, yeah, the phosphorus is driving their growth, but the nitrogen can be triggering the development of those cyanotoxins, particularly microcystins, because microcystins need a lot of nitrogen to create those molecules. Great, thank you. Very, very informative. Um, okay, so there was also a question about the slides. I just wanted to, to stay, I should have stated at the beginning that this whole summit is being recorded and will be available as well as the slides will be available. Um, so with that, we are going to take a short five minute break um, and then we will reset at the beginning of session two. So if you guys would please be back here, at, I'll give you an extra minute. 10.03, you can now take a, a short little break. Okay. Thank you. Thanks to the speakers.
Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're going to get started again. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Assistant Commissioner Katie Angarone, who is going to be leading a panel discussion on turning data into action. All right, Katie. All right, thanks to all the uh, all the presenters we had so far. It's such fascinating information. Um, all right, well, we tend to focus a lot and, uh, on mitigation and treatment, which are very important, um, but those me measures we know will not solve HABs. Back in 2019, I recall the commissioner um, saying that treatment of HABs is really like treating a symptom. If you have heart disease or some health issue, you know, you might take blood pressure medication and while that's essential, the better solution, the lasting solution is to change your lifestyle, to eat better, um, to exercise more. And really, it's the same for our waterways. We can treat HABs, mostly, uh, but unless we address the underlying issue, we're not going to prevent the HABs in the first place. The watershed approach is the lifestyle change that is needed for our ecosystems that are out of balance, where HABs are thriving. And this is not new information, but there certainly, I think, is a new urgency to the need for watershed approach. Um, with drinking water and our economy threatened, we no now know we absolutely need to act, and I think people are more interested in acting. Uh, the watershed approach isn't just about HAB prevention, of course. It ha that's just one of many co-benefits. The primary goal is the improvement of the health of our waterways, but in doing so, we also improve habitat, recreation, quality of life, and even property values. Measures to protect the watershed can also reduce impacts from heat, air pollution, and flooding. So it really is a multi-benefit approach. But if you're in this room, it's likely that you don't need me to sell you on all of that. So I'd like to introduce our panelists uh, one at a time and give each an opportunity to share a little bit about their experience, and then we're going to go into um, a Q&A. So I believe uh, Mike Pizarro is going first. And Mike is a practicing attorney with over 25 years of experience. As the advocacy director for the Watershed Institute, Mike engages with state and local officials to improve and protect New Jersey's watersheds. Mike, I'm gonna hand it over to you. You need to unmute my, yourself, sir. Oh, come on, I just did brilliant stuff and now I don't remember. Um, <laughs> You'd think after three years, I would have got this all figured out. Uh, let's see. It's thinking about presenting. Um, we can see your slide. There you go. Slide. Great. All right. So thanks. Uh, again, appreciate this opportunity to do this. I mean, this is such an important issue. Uh, and as Katie said, um, treating HABs is sort of the more expensive way of doing it. Um, so, how am I going to get the slides to advance? There we go. Um, so, I, you know, I thought taking a look at sort of some of the issues, what are causing the symptoms as the first sort of go around. And the first issue is, you know, we manage our stormwater one site at a time, one issue at a time. We don't look at it holistically. Our stormwater management rules, our ordinances, our regime uh, up through the at least the new MS4 permit has been trying to minimize the degradation, not reversing the trends. And the new MS4 permit is changing that. Our master plans, why we talk about uh, consistency with our neighbors, really mm -hmm. are municipal centric and largely more regions. And our ordinances, our zoning, our land use approvals, even DEP permits up till now, don't really take a holistic and cumulative approach on things. Um, so we are really sort of doing a thousand cuts. And I think in many of our, you know, some areas, HABs may be a driving force of some of these changes, but I think a large, large driving force for change and something we can utilize is flooding. Um, I have seen a huge uptake since Ida on flooding and concerns with flooding and people willing to start to rethink how they address uh, issues because of flooding. 
which sort of breaks my heart on some level. Uh, when I started you know, many years ago as an environmental attorney, I was really, really uh, gung ho on our goals of the Clean Water Act to restore and enhance our waters and to meet standards, I think by 1985. Uh, people always said, yeah, yeah, that's great, but how am I going to reduce my flooding? Uh, so, you know, in many of our areas, that's how we're going to start galvanizing some watershed approaches. Mm -hmm. And so there are multiple options for regional approaches. Our stormwater management rules allow it. Uh, the MS4 permit is going to encourage it. Even the Clean Stormwater and Flood Reduction Act, otherwise known as the Storm Stormwater Utilities Legislation, is going to allow it and encourage it. Uh, our, open, our open space plans can do it. Uh, and our zoning and ordinances, if we start to rethink about some things, can do it. Um, that is a hab in um, the millstone. Um, and I think TMDLs with the new MS4 permit is going to start to really encourage regional approaches looking at watersheds uh, because towns are going to be looking at this. And this is just the Stony Brook watershed, uh, sort of our home base, uh, and looking at those reductions and trying to figure out how to meet those. And so right now, there are multiple regional or watershed approaches, more regional than watershed necessarily, uh, already occurring. The you know, Watershed Institute is involved in three of them. This is the Stony Brook towns. They started meeting in the beginning of 2022 uh, as a direct result of Ida and starting to talk with neighboring towns on how to start solving some of those issues. The Somerset County has started to pull together the Somerset towns to do sort of the same thing. And then last year we started um, bringing the acid pink towns to start talking about flooding and water quality issues. And there is a huge amount of interest in this. Um, it, again, it's mostly a flooding issue, uh, but people are concerned about water quality. And so how to galvanize and move this forward. Um, so there is interest, but this is a change. You know, this is a different way of thinking. This is a different way than we've done things in the past. You know, we have done some watershed approaches, but they really didn't come to fruition. Uh, so we're going to need the support and there is a lot of support. So we have environmental commissions that, you know, those are the people who guide towns in environmental issues. Uh, they are a resource. Um, you have green teams, again, uh, Sustainable Jersey program, people really galvanize to move balls forward. You have community advocates. So there has been over the last several years, multiple environmental organizations who have been training advocates to interact with their towns, their planning boards, uh, to get better environmental resources and better environmental solutions. Uh, we've trained, uh, the Watershed Institute, almost about 100 advocates um, on environmental issues, flooding, water quality, and how to better engage with their elected officials. Volunteer scientists, and this is probably one of the largest groups. So there are approximately 25 or so organizations throughout the state, which isn't DEP or you know, DRBC or USGS, that are doing volunteer monitoring. Scientists are out there who have an understanding of water quality. Um, just for example, the, the Watershed Institute has trained over 80 volunteers that have active water quality monitoring. There's probably about 300 people doing a salt study throughout the state. Uh, so you have a cadre of scientists who understand the issues, who are seeing the real life impacts of what we are doing. Um, and these people can be uh, mobilized to support elected officials, support communities who want to look at things differently. And obviously you have watershed organizations and other environmental organizations that are on the ground uh, who are pushing these issues. And, you know, so looking at going for regional, we're going to, again, start to have to think beyond our municipal boundaries. And that is going to take a lot of political courage 
and thoughts. Um, and flooding, I think, is one of those mechanisms to really start to do it better. Um, and you know, here's just sort of data that we have. DEP has the Integrated Water Quality Report uh, to help motivate and engage those conversations graphically, very easy to understand. Um, and you don't have to be um, a scientist to understand, you know, orange or red is not great. Um, and that we need to start doing things differently. And then, you know, again, municipalities are starting to look for solutions to the flooding and starting to realize they can't solve it by themselves. You know, Manville, which is in my watershed, uh, has been subject to flooding for years and years and years. It has gotten worse. They have started to be more and more vocal on the issues. They've started attending planning board meetings in neighboring towns to complain because, you know, the way we look at land use development, we don't consider what is currently going on in that watershed in that region and what that additional development is going to do. Uh, our zoning, our municipal land use laws don't necessarily allow that. I think through the uh, watershed improvement plans and the MS4 permit, regional stormwater management and the stormwater rules or just loose uh, regional um, approaches through towns, we can start to drive some solutions. But a public that is engaged, that understands the issues, will support the town, support the elected officials in deriving these solutions and changing that status quo. And there's opportunities. So, you know, we're going to have to solve flooding. We're going to have to solve the water quality problems. And the new MS4 permit brings into the clean, you know, the Clean Water Act's obligation to actually restore our waterways. You know, and while this is small, here's Rocky Hill, a small borough within the Stony Brook Millstone watershed that is largely built out. It is completely surrounded by Montgomery Township and, you know, just south, uh, just north of Princeton. It has some flooding issues. To address it, it doesn't have a lot of options. It's mostly built out. Most of it was built out before modern stormwater rules. So for it to start reversing water quality issues, it can be extremely expensive. But another example, upstream of the Stony Brook, which runs into the Millstone, is Hopewell Township. Not as largely built out, a lot more opportunities. Why couldn't Rock contribute to projects, whether that is restoration of stream banks, riparian zones, reconnecting floodplains, um, better stormwater management for new development in Hopewell to solve the water quality issues and flooding issues in Rocky Hill, in Princeton and Lawrence and Pennington, which are all up and downstream. So starting to look at the financial benefits of our regional approach, a lot of uh, ur older urban areas, Trenton, again, largely built out, will have very few opportunities, and those opportunities will be expensive. And this is a completely different way of thinking. How do I spend money outside my, outside my jurisdiction to benefit not only myself, but all other users of that stream? Um, and that, again, goes back to where all of our supporters are, people who are subject to flooding, who can be readily engaged, these volunteer scientists that are doing the stream monitoring uh, and other advocates who have been trained to engage and support our communities. Um, so that's, you know, sort of a really quick overview. There are lots of regional approaches. I've talked about three. Uh, there's the 10 towns in the Great Swamp, uh, and there's a few others starting to go on, which I think uh, with some support from many many sectors, counties, municipalities, and community members, we can start to uh, start to address HABs, water quality, and flooding. So I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, you know, your point is well taken that stormwater is not comprehensively um, managed. To me, it is 
the fragmented and forgotten utility, unfortunately. Um, and one of the ways I think we get to um, to address it and deal with that political courage that will be needed is through data, um, because data drives policy and data is very hard to turn away from. So with that, I think I'm, we're gonna go on to our next speaker who is an excellent partner um, uh, fr from Rutgers. We have with us today, Kate Duhat, um, and she is with Rutgers University Center for Remote Sensing and Spatial Analysis, affectionately referred to as CRISA around our halls. Um, and she is a senior research specialist working closely with DEP to develop the watershed restoration and adaptation planning application. So we're going to hear a little bit about remote sensing and that from her. Kate? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. Um, so thanks for that introduction, Katie. And of course, everything fits together today. So. Um, I'm going to, I'm talking about this initiative that Rutgers and DEP are working on together, and it is to serve all the people that Katie talked about in the beginning, and then to try to also facilitate this watershed approach that Mike just talked about. So I'm Kate Dowsett, and I'm doing a lot of the technical um, portion of this project. And on our project team are probably a lot of names that you recognize. So um, Rick Lathrop and Gene Erb are some of the leads at Rutgers. And then we're working with a whole committee at DEP. So the goal of the NJRAP project is to maintain and improve water quality statewide. So um, NJRAP is, uh, should be supporting watershed characterization, so understanding what's going on, the condition, the stressors, um, supporting track down, and also helping identify the scope and limits of local planning. So as Mike mentioned, um, there's some things that you can accomplish locally and some things you can't, and so um, this should be providing data to, to understand the relationships between water quality and local conditions. And then we'll have some specific tools to support all kinds of decisions that you need to be making. So let me get into those details. Um, not limited to, but NJRAP can support um, stormwater utility, some of these um, permitting and planning decisions. Um, some of the regulatory, so setting uh, TMDL standards, um, supporting figuring out what partnerships you need, um, all of your local planning decisions, land acquisition, grants, um, MS4, and then most importantly, um, we're in the early planning stages, so we want to know what you need. So. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to have your voice heard. So, you know, what, what support do you need in watershed planning? So one of the um, more concrete things right now that's going on is that NJRAP is uh, filling some gaps that we already know about. So there's um, a project to supplement the wetlands map. So it's taking the existing um, land use, land cover wetlands and getting additional plant and habitat data from National Wetlands Inventory, and then trying to also add wetland function on top of that so that we know not only what's there, but what is it doing and how is it functioning in the watershed. We're creating a statewide riparian area map. So this um, will map out the hydrological, hydrologically connected areas. And then there will be an accompanying analysis to look at the relationship between riparian area width and water quality. And then we're going to be mapping the regulatory buffers on streams and wetlands. So translating the regulations onto the map um, to get a better sense of, uh, you know, for if you have a given stream, you already have upfront information about what kind of buffer is on that stream. And then um, 
the the larger project is to create three integrated web-based tools for um, to support kind of all your watershed planning water quality needs. So there's three um, modules under consideration. The first one is a general watershed health assessment, and that's um, to answer a lot of the general questions. What's the state of the waters? Um, what are the trends? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Um, what is the state doing to, um, you know, to improve things? And also, what can I do in my municipality or at the watershed level? And this will consist of a summary and report, so maps, tables, and it will have information like trends. So, for example, here's the Raritan watershed, and um, this is showing impervious surface um, at these Huck 14 levels. And we see that over time, looking at land use, um, impervious surface is increasing overall, but not to the same degree in every uh, sub watershed. The second module will be a water quality stressor tool. So this is to answer questions like what sources are contributing to impairments and how can I you know, make a watershed plan to improve water quality. And this will take the form of an interactive mapping tool um, that will be a starting point for track down. So as an example, you know, we might can combine what we already have in the HABs dashboard, but also combine it with, um, you know, all the known structures in the area the, um, that we know contribute to, to HABs already. So get all that information in one place for you. And then the third module is a water quality improvement opportunity tool. So this will address questions like, which are the water bodies that need restoration or improvement? Um, you know, what should I do? What's the best restoration approach? What best management practices should I use? And then also what information or data is missing to either identify the water body or identify the best um, approach to make improvements. And this will also be some uh, interactive map, most likely. And um, again, if taking the example um, of the HABs dashboard, it would combine the information, like we already know the location of, a, um, of an impairment, and then it would help uh, select um, or suggest the best types of best management practice that could lead to improvements at that site. So we're learning from the existing resources out there because there are a lot of data sources and web tools. So we want to take the best of what already exists and um, take advantage of that. And we really need to hear from you. So if there's tools that you're using that are working for you, um, you know, if you have something you're trying to do in watershed management that you need information or support about, we want to know all about it. Um, so we have a survey that we're at the beginning of this process still um, in the planning process. So NJ RAP will be rolling out over the next um, 18 months. Uh, you know, it'll probably be a piece by piece where we'll tr try to get priority pieces out sooner, but it will be built, built by Legos where pieces will come on board over time. Um, so we want to hear from you. There's a survey that is opening today and will be open for um, the next two weeks. So I'm going to put the link in the chat, um, but this is the address. So take that survey, please let us know. Even if you were at our kickoff meeting, um, you know, we took some of the takeaways that we heard from that and we want to hear a little bit more. So let us know what you what you need, what you think. And also, if you want to get in touch about anything else at all, um, here's here's my contact information. And then Janine Barr, who um, is a great point of contact for the project. So I'm going to put that um, this link in the chat and then uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Kate. That's wonderful. Um, you know, we are really 
one of the reasons we're going so heavy on the um, solicitation of uh, feedback is because we want to build something that is not a wonky tool. It's not for experts. It's for everyone. And um, my thought process is to kind of model it after the healthy community plan, which hopefully you have all seen um, that generates reports for um, 564 municipalities. Um, so at any rate, I, I'm hoping it'll be an application for everyone. Um, we heard a little bit from Kate about the track down function. And so we're going to shift over to uh, Bob Schuster, who's going to tell us a little bit about how he accomplishes that. Um, and Bob is the Bureau Chief with the Department's Bureau of Marine Water Monitoring and has over 30 years of experience in collection, ke uh, ke chemical, biological and micro microbial analysis and data assessment of marine waters. So with that, I will hand it to you, Bob. Thanks, Katie. Um, can everybody see the screen? Is that working? We can see your slides. They're not in presentation mode, but we can see your slides. OK. And, and we can hear you perfectly. OK, awesome. Oh, there you go. Yep. Good All right, I'm here to talk about kind of the track down, how to characterize uh, problems. I have a long history of doing pathogen source track down, but it relates to all sorts of pollutants. Um, one of the key elements is it was brought up and Fred's talk was great, is you need that monitoring data because really what you need to do is identify what that impairment clearly that you want to rectify or fix or determine the source. And for that could be beach closures to pathogen, shellfish area closures, HAB, HAB intensity, nutrient loads that might drive HABs. One of the key elements is how do you link that rate, all those different conditions that might cause what you're seeing. So we talk about MS4, nutrient loading, runoff. That, that, that's what we need. We need to know when does that come in and how does that affect everything. Um, it could also include stream flows. We mentioned about flows. It, it could be weather, climate change. So once you identify those impairments and what you're really trying to address, you need to utilize, which leads into what Kate was working on, that land use, GIS coverage. What is out there that could contribute what we're concerned with to that water body? Um, so looking at that, it's land use, urban development. Is it is it sewer areas? Is it septic areas? Are there stormwater outfalls? Is there ag? Or what are riparian buffers look like? All of those could could come into play and could lead to that more intensive type of monitoring around those sources. So you have to consider those logistics of designing sampling when you find those potential sources. This could be on a small scale of a small lake or a pond, but could be on a watershed scale where you have to be adaptive and change your sampling protocols depending upon what you find. Um, if you're rainfall impacted, we recommend it gets very intensive. You want to know what it looks like before it rained, what it looks like when, when pipes first start to flow or runoff first starts to get generated on that first flush. You want to look at it you know, an hour, two hours after the next day. Um, you want to know how that changes over time because knowing how long it takes for pollutants to get to an area can tell you where that source might be originating from. And you always want to take that data and assess it um, effectively and look at it because you might need to revise your sample collection if you're not finding, you know, that really high level. If you might need to continually work upstream in an area or move to another and intensify an area where you know high levels are coming from to further refine what you're seeing because that's all going to be needed to how do you come up with a remediation action and where do you do it? And I like to think of that, you know, you might find an area that's bad with high nutrient loadings. It might be one stormwater outfall out of five where if we that give us the most load. If we can find out what works to rectify that one, we can apply it across the board. You might not have to do everything. So that's how we can get to those recommended actions, you know, and then you want to always follow up when you take actions in those same locations. How effective were those actions? If they were effective, then you can apply them in, in other areas that have similar conditions and try them. So it's, it, it's finding those pilot areas. Um, 
to go through, you, you know, from a HAP perspective, nutrients, in lake source, external sources, how those change by season. You want to look at spatial differences across larger lakes or water bodies. Temperature, air and water, we heard that earlier. Rainfall patterns, dry, wet. It could be, you know, a, a local rainfall pattern on a short term scale, one week, couple days, but it could also mean seasonal wet, dry patterns as well as flow. So you need to get that data collection, assessment, look at all the land use, and then actually go out and look at all of those conditions and say, what do I think is occurring? Um, I will go through some quick slides. Seasonal variation on one of our studies that we worked on in Bud Lake, the diatom cyanobacteria green algae have huge seasonal variations can alter from year to year. So we have nutrient data to go with this. How did the nutrient profiles change over that annual time period? Because some things might lead to other things occurring, and that's an important factor to know. Um, an example on a PACOM, we, we take a PACOM because we have a lot of data. If you look in this north area, um, ST16, 1, 17, then you look at Crescent Cove, ST3, or you go to the south, ST5 and 14. When we had a lot of nutrient data in 2019, you could see 16, 17, 3, 1, 5, 14, typically had overall the highest nutrient concentrations by station. That's important to know from that spatial perspective of where might the biggest loads be coming in. Um, with that, you can look at data. This was just a nitrate plot at 16. We can see ele more elevated concentrations when you're closer to some rain events and some spikes. We know we have wet weather come event driving it. Um, on the southern shore at site 14, there was a continuous water quality monitoring buoy. This is the daily average rainfall versus the phycocyanin response by cyanobacteria. Yeah, you know, as a measure of cyanobacteria abundance. And you could see when you had rain events, you always saw an uptick in the cyanobacteria signature, followed by a drop off when we went through a dry period. Um, so you can follow patterns by looking at all these types of data. And why is that important? Because these are the MS4 per permit, these are the MS4 outfalls within the north where we had high levels within Crescent Cove, ST3 where there are high levels, and at where the buoy and ST5 where nutrient inputs came in after wet weather events. So we may be seeing specific areas that these, are, these loads are coming in from, and that's an important evaluation because it's likely we want to get a better handle on what outfalls, is it all of them, is it one or two, is it three? How are these outfalls in different areas impacting the, the water quality and nutrients. Millstone was the opposite, and we'll hear a lot more on the millstone later, but this occurred in drought conditions on during low flow on the river. This is saying that the sources of nutrients in the river itself may have been driven more by continuous source of nutrients coming in, not, not a rainfall effect. Rainfall in other seasons may have caused conditions upstream and impoundments to have a plume which fed the millstone, but what happened in the millstone was under low flow. Um, USGS has great sites to look at flow and that circle part off on the right, that was the flow during the millstone had, where that whole time prior to that, you see flows were much, much more elevated. Um, we can see that the nutrients in the millstone over the course of time, are the concentrations are higher in the millstone when the flow is actually lower. Again, saying this is a continuous source in the millstone. So if you have a hab that gets it gets into the millstone, low flow conditions, it's going to have that supply of nutrients. The overall long-term weather pattern, I highlighted the yellow because when you mention a PACONG, 2018 was one of the wettest years on record going back to 1895, 65 inches of rain, annual rainfall, followed by a very wet spring that led into that 2019 bloom, when then you see the rainfall levels start to drop off. Um, I think I highlighted the blue, because that was the rainfall we had in that area when we had the low flow in the millstone, 
But looking at what happened preceding that, there were some pretty wet weather events in April and May, which might have given rise to cyanobacteria blooms in upstream locations or impoundments that then made it to the millstone and had that low flow condition. So characterizing all these types of conditions is what's really important and how you link that data to land use, how you develop further monitoring to address those potential sources. This is my contact info. Uh, all right. Yep. Thank you, Bob. Um, you're like the Columbo of water quality, and I love that. <laughs> Um, all right, so from problem characterization, I want to shift to the permitting that is designed to directly um, address the issues, and in particular, the latest um, MS4 permit, I think, is particularly well poised for this and will really help us make tangible progress. So I'd like to introduce Gabe Mahan, um, who uh, holds a BS in chemical engineering and is currently a licensed professional engineer in both Pennsylvania and Delaware. Gabe uh, has been with the department for over 18 years and is the bureau chief of the Bureau of Nijipti's Stormwater Permitting and Water Quality Management, where Gabe manages the WQMP program, the Nijipti's Industrial Stormwater Permit Program, the Municipal Stormwater Regular Regulation Program, which also includes the uh, stormwater management rules, as well as the Nijipti's Municipal Separate Storm System uh, Permits, or MS4, affectionately known. So Gabe, with that, I'll hand it to you. All right, thanks, Katie. So like Katie said, I manage all those various programs for the department, um, but specifically today, I'm gonna talk about MS4 largely. First, I'm gonna go into a little very brief background of MS4 in New Jersey, and a also a brief summary of our MS4 tier reassignment we did last year, and a bit about our MS4 renewal process, and then a more detailed explanation of one of the new permit requirements, the watershed improvement plan. So first, the background, um, NJDEP is delegated by the US EPA to implement the Federal National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Program, which is NIPTES. In New Jersey, this is known as the NIGIPTES program. And this includes the MS4 Stormwater Permitting Program. So under our MS4 program, we really had four different MS4 general permits. Those are our public complex permit, which applies to um, government agencies generally that have two buildings or more with a population of a thousand um, so that could be things like jails or hospitals or college campuses um, then we also have our highway agency permit which applies to the various highway agencies in the state like every county the dot the the turnpike um, and then we have those permits that we issue to municipalities and that was the tier a and the tier b permit for a long time since 2004 um, but last year we reevaluated those assignments and I'll, I'll talk about that um, a little bit more on the next slide. The, the tier B though was a state only permit, so it was not actually considered a NIPTES permit under the Federal Clean Water Act. And because of that, it really didn't include any of the conditions based on the Clean Water Act, such as any water quality based permit conditions. It really only contained a small subset of the tier A permit requirements. Now, the federal rules do require that we reevaluate our permit assignments on a periodic basis, and we had not done that reevaluation since the inception of our MS4 program in 2004. EPA had also communicated to us in their audit of our NIGIPTES program and in comments on our previous MS4 permit renewal that we really needed to do that reevaluation. So uh, we did undertake that reevaluation last year. Basically, we were assessing if there was, as it says on the slide, a potential to increase or to result in exceedances of water quality standards if they're discharging pollutants into waters with TMDLs for those pollutants, or if there was going to be other impacts, significant impacts to water quality like HABs, or if they're discharging into sensitive waters like Pinelands waters or trout production waters. So, we undertook that evaluation, and what we determined from reviewing our integrated water quality report is that every tier B town had at least one impairment or TMDL for a pollutant that is present in municipal stormwater discharges. On top of that, the federal rules also require that anyone that has more than a thousand population in their urbanized area also needs a permit. 
So there were actually were 11 municipalities that since the inception of the program in 2004 have now exceeded the thousand population in the urbanized area. And as a result of this, and of course, like the slide says, also 82 towns also are discharging into those sensitive waters and some have had HABs as well. And because of that, we decided that all 101 tier B municipalities needed to be reassigned to tier A, and we did that in July of last year. So next I'm going to go through the MS4 renewal a bit. We did some preliminary outreach back in August of 2021. You know, we had a good turnout of 122 people at those sessions, and we issued a pre-draft permit after, the, after those sessions in March of 2022. So we took comments from what we got on the pre-draft and did some outreach as well there and then put together an actual draft permit. But before we issued that draft permit, we wanted to ensure that anyone we are reassigning as part of that reevaluation I just discussed was well aware that they were gonna be a permittee under this permit that we were renewing. So we did the tier reassignments prior to ever issuing the draft permit so that everyone would know that they were subject to that permit. Um, and then the final permit was issued on December 1st of last year and became effective in January 1st of this year. But importantly, since all tier B's were reassigned to tier A, the permit essentially now applies to almost all municipalities in the state. It applies to anyone that's operating a, an MS4, a, you know, a municipal separate storm sewer system, which is basically all but seven municipalities in the state. There's two that don't really operate any storm sewer systems, at least as far as we're aware, and there's five that operate exclusively combined sewer systems. So none of those seven have an MS4 permit, but all the other municipalities do. So specifically, I want to go through the watershed improvement plan. The purpose of the watershed improvement plan is to improve water quality at the watershed level by reducing MS4 contributions of pollutants mm -hmm. to water bodies that have impairments and TMDLs, and also to reduce stormwater related flooding. So these impairments affect fish and aquatic biota, drinking water intakes that supply the water we drink, coastal waters where many of us swim every summer, and harmful algal blooms in lakes and even rivers due to poor water quality are also occurring more frequently in the summer months. Some of these waters have no other discharges into them other than the local MS4. Therefore, the department is requiring that each tier A permittee develop what we're calling a watershed improvement plan to determine what improvements can be made to reduce their contribution of pollutants that are causing impairments to the state's waters. And importantly, as it says at the bottom of the slide, this plan is developed with public input. It's not something that the municipality does alone in the dark and then releases it. It's something that is, should aid the residents and the businesses, the neighboring towns, everyone should be working together to develop these plans, hence the watershed approach. So I'm going to go into the to the details of the plan a bit more. It's broken into really three different phases, and these three phases have separate due dates. So phase one is what we're calling a watershed inventory report, and that is due in three years, uh, th three years from January 1st. And this is going to really be an electronic map of everything of their system. And I'll go into the details of all the things they need to map on, on the next slide. Um, it's important to note, though, that much of the information of what's required there is either something the municipality already has, like they've already long been required to map their outfalls, or other things are available in the department's GIS layers. So it need not be entirely developed from scratch. The next phase is the watershed assessment report which will be due in four years, and that's going to take things to the next step. It's going to take the, what you figured out in phase one and then start assessing potential projects that you can do to uh, improve the water quality. And then phase three is going to be the final plan. So you basically, after you finish phase two, you, you've got a draft plan done. You're gonna do public comment on that, make some changes as, as it relates to the public comment, and then you're going to finalize it and that'll be phase three which is due basically at the end of this permit cycle. So that'll be December 31st of what, 2027. OK, so this is the specifics of the watershed inventory inventory report. So it's an electronic map of all the stormwater outfalls owned by the permittee, the drainage areas for each of those outfalls, the receiving water bodies, the water quality classification of those receiving water bodies, all stormwater interconnections from one MS4 into another. And if you're not someone that's intimately involved with the MS4 program, you might not realize this, but there are a tremendous amount of interconnections. Just think about a situation where a municipality has like a DOT road or a county owned roadway that goes through the center of town. Well, at every one of those intersections to a municipal road, there's an interconnection between the county or the DOT's MS4 and the municipalities. 
Um, and of course, we want to see the drainage areas for those interconnections as well. And wherever they are connecting into another entity storm sewer system, like um, a privately owned facility or a, a, say like a public complex that's in their municipality. Then we want to know where their storm drain inlets are. The areas associated with each of the TMDLs they have, areas associated with water quality impairments, overburdened communities, impervious areas, and the location and owner ownership of all stormwater outfalls and basins and infrastructure that are not owned by the permittee. Um, all of this stuff is really important to be able to assess the impact that you're having on water quality. So you'll take what you develop in that plan um, and you'll use it to develop the watershed assessment report. And importantly, the watershed assessment report is going to include projects um, that you're going to actually implement to reduce your impacts. And this is where you can really tie it back to what Bob was just talking about. So you know you have an impairment for, for let's say, fecal coliform and you need need to figure out where that's coming from. Well, that that sort of source track down is, I, is exactly what you're going to do to figure out what that source is so that you can then put that project here into your watershed assessment report as one of the projects that you're going to undertake to eliminate whatever the cause of that of that discharge is. Obviously, when you look to what municipalities, what impairments municipalities have, you're going to see that it's not insignificant. Many municipalities might have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different impairments in their waters. So you're obviously not going to be able to just come up with a list of projects and implement those the next day and solve everything. So this is going to be a plan that you're going to undertake over the course of several years. Um, and of course, this plan also starts to have to include that feedback from the public information session. So we want to know, you know, what kind of feedback did you get in those public information sessions and how did you address that in your plan? We also want to see an estimate of how you're going to fund the projects going forward, and that really could be any source, but there's a list here of some potential sources. And then we want to see an implementation schedule, and then once you've done this, you put this actually on your website for a 60 day public comment period. And then the final plan is going to be due December 31st, 2027, and this is going to summarize everything I just talked about. Summary of all the proposed locations and load reductions of your water quality improvement projects, both public and private because certainly it, it would be impossible most likely for the municipality to solve all the problems without working with the private landowners in the community. It's going to be a summary of the public comments re you received and any changes you made to the plan as a result, a summary of how the projects will be co coordinated with other regulatory requirements and that, you know, we have a long list in the permit of potential regulatory requirements you should consider, but that really could be anything. Um, and then a proposed implementation schedule for the project a schedule of your future public information sessions and problems identified that are outside the jurisdiction of the permittee. So like I mentioned on this slide, that could be something like agricultural properties where you really don't have significant control over what's happening there or just other land that's not under the jurisdiction of the municipality. And this is where the department can can jump in and try to help coordinate solutions for these problems. Then we also want to see the costs broken down by project and year and funding opportunities that will be sought. And then uh, the plan also needs to describe how stormwater related problems in overburdened communities have been prioritized because we really want to focus on addressing the problems in those communities first if you can. So that really summarizes everything I wanted to talk about here. So with that, I'll turn it back to Katie. All right, Gabe, thank you. That was a lot of information and I'm looking forward to um, our panel discussion and, and chat so that we can talk more about it. There are some amazing questions in the chat, ones that we have been tossing around the department as well. Um, and I will note that, you know, one of the things that excites me about the um, MS4 permits is that inventory. That's the data that will drive the policy. It will help you understand um, what uh, levers you can pull in your in your watershed, in your municipality, in which you cannot, and, and our upstream or downstream issues. Um, and we know that uh, addressing water quality is not cheap, it's not easy, and that um, it our municipalities in particular are stressed at this moment. We've just had a pandemic, there's water quality accountability to deal with, PFAS, there's a lot coming at our municipalities. Um, so, you know, I think the best way that we can help with that is to talk about money and what the available um, funding opportunities are. So I'm going to introduce um, Paul Hawk, who is a Bureau Chief in Water Resource Management's Division of Water Quality 
uh, Bureau of Construction Payments and Administration. And the Bureau manages the implementation of, New Jer of the New Jersey Water Bank financing program, preparation of the state revolving fund capitalization grant applications, and development of the Water Bank's clean water priority system intended use plan and project priority list. That's an awful lot to say he's the money man. And I'm going to hand it to Paul. Thank you, Katie. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to go through what um, financing the water bank could provide to um, water quality improvement projects and, and the, the level of resources that we have to, pro to provide. Um, first of all, the water bank is a partnership between the DEP and the New Jersey I Bank, which is an independent state financing authority. Um, and our mission is to provide low cost financing for the planning design and construction of water infrastructure projects. We do this through the uh, Clean Water State Revolving Fund and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, which are jointly administered by the Water Bank. Um, the Clean Water State Revolving Fund was established by Congress under the Clean Water Act in 1987, and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund was established in 1996 under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, this slide presents the sources of funding and how we use it, um, starting at the nine o'clock, the state of New Jersey. Um, for the last three years, the state has provided $60 million per year in state appropriations to the water bank for funding. And those, those funds are important because they offer the most flexibility to the program. They don't have the federal requirements that come with the SRF uh, cap grants. The state also appropriated almost $300 million of American Rescue Plan Act funds in this year's budget to the DEP to use for water infrastructure. And we're using that in the SRFs as well. Moving around, um, every year we get about $100 million in capitalization grants from the US EPA for the SRFs. On top of that, for the next five years, we're going to be receiving about $200 million a year from the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, and those funds have to be matched by the DEP. Usually a, a normal cap grant, we match 20% with the bipartisan infrastructure law funds. The, the match is a little less. But those funds also come into the water bank. Then the I bank um, leverages those funds um, by providing market rate financing to projects. So anywhere from 25% of the project's funds to 75% come from the iBank. And we combine that with repayments that we get every year, which is about $150 million for projects previously funded. And that all results in our ability to provide about a billion dollars a year for the next five years um, to projects through um, low, low interest rate financing and including principal forgiveness or, or grant-like financing. Um, over the last few years, we've been trying to improve the program and make financing easier for municipalities and, and applicants. We provide up to 30-year loan terms or the useful life of the project, whichever is less. We accept applications on a rolling basis throughout the year. And then when the project is ready to proceed, we award funding on a rolling basis as well. Um, we provide low interest uh, short term loans during the construction period, and those are converted to long term loans once all work is complete. Uh, the application process itself is very easy. We have an online web portal we call H2 Loans. Um, all submittals are electronic through this portal. Um, reviews take place, DP staff reviews the applications, um, communicates with project sponsors through this uh, website, so it's very easy. The first step is just submitting basic project information so that we can rank and rank the project and determine whether it's eligible for our funding or not. Then once that project is entered into our system, most applicants check a box and request a, a pre-application meeting, and then we'll sit down um, with their project team and uh, DP project team and go over all the requirements and, and any issues that we see that might uh, impact financing. Um, 
when we found out that the bipartisan infrastructure law funding was coming our way, the, the commissioner um, developed this water infrastructure investment plan concept. And the process is really to um, optimize the limited funds that we, we have for uh, high priority water infrastructure projects, make sure it's, those funds are being well used and that the funding programs that we develop are most um, helpful to the people who need it. Um, the, ba the basis of the, the planning process is really enhanced public um, engagement and collaboration. So we've held over a dozen engagement sessions, uh, public hearings to try to get feedback on, on our plans and how we intend to use the funds. And actually our, our next um, session is tomorrow at 1230. If you're interested in attending, you would just come to this site, the DP WIIP, and click on WIP sessions, and it takes you right to the registration information. There's also um, the ability on this site to uh, email us with any questions or comments. We have links to additional funding resources, um, including 319 grants, any stormwater grants that are available. Um, and we also have extensive experience um, co-funding projects with USDA, uh, HUD, FEMA. So if there's one thing to take away, it's this um, website address. You can come here to find anything about the Tide Bank and the Water Bank. Great. Um, every year we, we have to produce an intended use plan for how we're going to use the federal cap grant funds. It goes through a public uh, comment period. It's usually the draft is usually issued in January. We have a public hearing in February and then usually finalize the document in March or April. This slide goes over who who can apply for funds and what types of projects we fund. Um, for clean water, eligible recipients are local government units or MUAs. Um, we do lend to private entities, but only through a, a municipal government. They would have to uh, take responsibility for paying back the loan. We do have the, the ability to lend to private colleges and universities for non-point source projects. Uh, we do not lend to federally owned facilities or privately owned wastewater or stormwater collection and treatment systems. The bulk of our projects are mainly wastewater infrastructure, treatment plants, uh, pump station upgrades, uh, collection systems, CSOs. Um, we also finance stormwater management projects, including green infrastructure. And some projects that most people don't think of is um, equipment purchases, anything that's needed to maintain uh, stormwater facilities or, or wastewater facilities. So street sweepers, vac trucks, um, sewer cleaning and jetting equipment. We also financed uh, skimmer boats in the past, as well as uh, weed harvesters and any kind of you know, back hose loaders or dump trucks needed to maintain uh, systems. We also fund the planning and design efforts for the capital improvement project, and we'll look back if you submit an application, we'll look back two years on and also fund any any efforts that went into the planning up to your application. This is our um, chart for what we're what the funding uh, packages that we'll be offering in SFY24. Um, it's currently proposed and we expect to finalize it in the next few weeks. The highlighted numbers are um, the water quality restoration category is basically projects that address um, documented occurrences of HABs and can reduce the um, frequency of occurrences. And for those uh, projects, we provide 50% principal forgiveness, which is like a grant up to two and a half million dollars per project. Um, we also offer 100% principal forgiveness to communities that meet our affordability criteria. And in order Paul, to meet the. Yeah. Paul, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it seems nope. like your your slides are not advancing. We're stuck on seven. Uh, the intended use plan. OK, I'm sorry. No worries. 
you see that now or? All, right. uh, All right, here we are. Thank you. I still see. Oh, wait, hold on. Sync to I'm presenter still, slides. I'm still seeing oh. slide seven. I wonder if you take it down, Paul, and then start again. Maybe that will reset whatever has gone yeah. awry. You know what? <laughs> Let me try to take over. Which you should be on nine. Yes. All right. Can everybody see that? And then you want to try to take back over from me, and then maybe we'll we'll link up take at control. the very top. Okay. Great. Right. Six, seven, eight. There you go. Working. We're at nine. Great. <laughs> All right. So this this might be easier to understand. So the water quality restoration is basically our our HAB category, and you would get um, fifty percent principal forgiveness up to two and a half million dollars for that type of project. Any community uh, proposing any type of water quality project in an affordability community, which to qualify for that, you have to basically have an MHI in your town of 80% of the state's MHI. You would get 100% principal forgiveness for the first $2 million in project costs. So if you were a, an affordability community and you want to purchase street sweepers or vac trucks, most likely you'd get 100% of those costs um, as grant-like or principal forgiveness funding. Um, this is the first project we funded under the, the HAB or the water quality restoration category. Um, as you all know, in summer 2019, Lake Apacon uh, suffered extensive HABs. Af after that, we heard we had a lot of input from the public that they would like additional principal forgiveness for HAB, so we added it to the SFY 21 intended use plan. And this, uh, the borough of Apacon was the first to apply for this project, it's 32 homes that had failing septic systems um, on Hudson Avenue, which is adjacent to Crescent Cove and Lake Apacon. Uh, construction was completed in the spring of 21, and that project received a $460,000 loan, and half of it was forgiven. Um, one other program that's brand new for this year, um, the water bank is providing no cost technical assistance to disadvantaged communities to help um, get their projects in for financing, uh, prioritize their projects, uh, complete capital improvement plans, uh, and help to um, identify not only water bank, but other types of funding for their uh, water infrastructure projects. We also provide support for community engagement to help get the word out of why these projects are important and, and gain support from the community. And on the drinking water side, we do also provide help with engineering services required to implement projects. Thank you. That's um, Here's all my contact information, or if you want to get back to that WIP website. All right, thanks, Paul. So um, that was a ton of information. We are going to launch into um, a Q&A, but first we're going to ask, we're going to go back and we're going to try our hand at the poll again. <laughs> and we're going to ask um, folks to answer the following questions. Do you find that watershed managers understand the stressors in their watershed and how they impact water quality? For example, HABs. And what challenges do municipalities have implementing watershed management? These are two questions that I think the answers um, will help inform how we craft our policy. So chat, uh, the link is in the chat. You can also use the QR code and, and use your phone so you don't disturb your screen. I get very nervous when I disturb my screen. I don't know about anyone else. <laughs> um, and then so the, we will the we'll leave that open. Yeah, we will we will leave that open for I think about a minute or or so, um, and then we'll put the uh, responses in the in the chat. 
And then we'll start with some panel questions and we will do our best. Also, we are trying to answer questions in the chat. We might get to some of them in the course of our conversation with our panelists as well. I'm hopeful that everyone sees the thread that we um, that we intended to stitch through all of this. It's boring. Hi, this the second the second poll has now been launched. I'm having FOMO, so I'm going to take it myself. <laughs> Adriana has launched the results of the first poll in the chat, and it seems that overall the vast majority of folks to the answer of uh, somewhat to do you find that watershed managers understand the stressors in their watersheds and how they impact water quality like cabs. And the next poll has also been closed and she is posting um, the results and that is looking like overall funding has been identified as the biggest challenge. And yes, Nancy, we do recognize that there are multiple, <laughs> multiple answers to that question. So the driving number one, um, you know, choice being funding and, and politics here. So thanks for participating in our survey, Katie. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that there are lots of conversations to be had because you're right, a, a simple survey cannot possibly <laughs> capture all of it. So I think, um, you know, building off of that survey and, and opening that conversation up, I'd like to ask, Mike, who deals primarily on the front lines with our municipalities, um, you know, what are what are ways of improving the success for municipalities that are interested in watershed management? Um, oof. I, I, I think with, with that poll, there's multiple answers, multiple songs with that. Um, I think part of it is getting the elected officials and the professionals to sit down and truly understand the issues. Uh, there's a lot of, um, in many municipalities, let me put out the fire and then put out the next fire and then sitting down and thinking of these things holistically may not be one of those things that they have an opportunity. Um, but this is gonna require really a change in the way we all operate, which is going to require public support. If I'm going to have to change my zoning because the area that I'm, you know, have high density development going in is already flooding or is just, you know, upstream of an area that is flooding. Having the community understand what's going on, why it's happening and the impacts is going to be vital. And getting the towns to talk to each other to exchange information exchange problems and exchange solutions is also you know one of the regional approaches that we were involved in recently one of the biggest things the the participants wanted was the contact information for each other you know so these were neighbors municipal officials uh, you know ec members and they didn't know didn't really know their neighbors um so providing that support also will be useful yeah, you know, that's interesting here at the department. Um, I, I would say our municipalities <laughs> are our programs mm -hmm. and I have I have watched us change the way that we interact. You can see that we've got a number of people who know each other well and understand how our issues connect. Um, it, and that's because we've set down some infrastructure and um, a group and SOPs with uh, regular meeting times. And so I think for the for the local um, governments, that's probably not a bad practice to take mm -hmm. on. Um, and what strikes me from my own uh, local experience is the great willingness on on part of some of these committees and these volunteers. You know, municipalities are in large part run by volunteers. 
they show up because they care. So you've already got a pre-selected group of folks yeah. that if we could we could make sure they understand the connections between their decisions and water quality, um, it's built in support. So that, you know, I'm just going to add that um, to it. But I want to I want to hear from um, from, I think, Gabe um, as well, because Gabe, you you work in a permitting program where you, the person you're dealing with can really vary from municipality to municipality. So in your in your mind, um, what role does the community or local officials have in water quality management? Yeah, so I, I think um, for that question, I think it, it it differs if you're talking about the community as a whole or just the local officials, right? The local officials certainly play a significant role. Um, you know, many of the decisions that are affecting the, the quality of your stormwater runoff are made at the local level in, in terms of like the land use planning. And stormwater certainly plays a huge role in the water quality and flooding impacts that your community suffering. While it's, you know, it's not 100%, but like if you look at our discharges from wastewater, it's, it's all going to wastewater treatment plants and it's monitored at the discharge point so we know exactly what's coming out of there. And that's just simply not the case with stormwater. So much of that is affected by, um, you know, just your, your decisions as, as to where you're going to pave and where you're going to preserve your open space. You know, obviously, paving close to the water course is going to allow more pollutants to get into the water course than if you have a riparian zone in front of it that's going to prevent that. So, so you know, your 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 local officials are making those kind of decisions, but the community um, community certainly is involved in making those decisions. You know, as raising your voice up to your local officials to let them know what you want, but also the community as a whole, you can can have a direct impact, right? Like join up with a, a local watershed group and actually help participate in the MS4 uh, requirements. There are lo local watershed groups all across the country that are you know, helping to do mapping or helping to implement projects or helping to do education re and outreach in the community. And all those things are MS4 permit requirements and you can help your municipality achieve those. But I think, like I mentioned briefly, I think the most important thing is to talk to your local officials about what you want in your community. For example, I'm sure you've seen in the news the rain tax, right? So after the stormwater utility law got released, well, that's a propaganda campaign against the stormwater utility. And I think the knee-jerk reaction from a lot of elected officials is like, we're not going to do anything that's going to cost our residents any more money. But if you talk to the residents in your community and what they want is improved water quality and what they want is reduced flooding, and it's in like in the form of a stormwater utility rather than just a regular tax that could go to anything, the funds for a stormwater utility are specifically tied to only stormwater related things. So your community can't just spend that money on something else. So if that's what the community wants and they're willing to pay for it, you got to let your elected officials know that so that they can allow those things to move forward in your community. I think one of you know one of the things we talk a lot about in at the department is um, the cost of inaction, and um, we also talk about climate change and how that's going to impact all of our bottom lines. There's in fact some, a great document just came out of the White House on this, um, and I think we need to shift our thinking um, at times to recognize that these. These measures are investments in our future. They prevent damage down the down the line, uh, damage which impacts the community and the health of the economic community. So, Gabe, thanks for that that great answer. Um, we did get some questions in the chat, sort of about how um, how a watershed approach dovetails with the MS4 obligations. So, can I ask you to just sort of touch on that for a second? Yeah, so I mean, very specifically, it's it's like I covered in my presentation, right? The 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 watershed improvement plan is going to be the biggest way they dovetail with a watershed approach. And despite the fact that our MS4 permits are issued on a municipal by municipal basis, that's just the structure of our MS4 program in the state. Uh, we are really encouraging municipalities to work together on watershed improvement plans to do it on a watershed basis because, you know, like is mentioned in some of the presentations, you know, it might be cheaper and more cost effective and manpower effective to do something in the upstream watershed than rather than to do it in your community. And maybe if you pay your up your neighboring community to do that, they will rather than trying to find some way to 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 spend a ton of money in your area where there's just nowhere to do it. Like an example that comes to mind and it was in the Pacific Northwest. We were talking to someone about how they're managing things out there and they had a temperature TMDL because they have uh, salmon that come up the river and the discharge from their wastewater treatment plant was too warm. 
So rather than spend a ton of money at the wastewater treatment plant to put in some sort of cooling system, which would have cost millions, they did a ton of projects throughout the community, spent less money, you know, planting trees that shade the water bodies and all other things that achieved the same effect, but also at the same time improved their community. So it's really important to look at it holistically so you can find those approaches that, yeah, there could be 50 approaches that solve the problem, but there's only one that does it the best way that helps everyone the most. Yeah, that's a that's a great example. Um, and EPA, by the way, is on board with that approach, even though it, it, it doesn't um, fit neatly into the regulatory schema. So I, I think, you know, the days of strict um, um, strict compliance uh, are probably shifting and we're going to have to shift to this idea of can we solve the problem with another permittee elsewhere and also have um, massive co-benefits. So, um, so thank you for that. And I think, I think too, you know, one of the one of the things that my team is tired of hearing me say is that um, the local committees, like for example, if Gabe mentioned open space, um, open space oftentimes does account for water quality with a simple metric in their prioritization scheme of proximity to a waterway. Well, maybe that's not enough anymore. Maybe we need to understand the data better to understand where the opportunities are to reforest a parcel that's adjacent to um, a water body, for example. And I think that is what NJRAP will help us do. So I, I, I want to shift um, for a second to, to Kate. What are the indicators that um, are being contemplated for inclusion in NJRAP? And Will there be an opportunity to sort of ground truth them? Is is NJ Rap a one and done? I guess is the question. Um, so there's a few categories of indicators. Uh, first of all, kind of understanding the state of the waters. Um, we'll be looking at the biological indicators, so the AMNET and fish index of biotic integrity, because those are good indicators that kind of integrate all the different sources so we can get a sense of um, where the impairments are. Um, also, presence of halves is a good indicator of the impairments, um, and a few others like the shellfish um, classification or beach closing. So that gives us an idea of where things are going wrong. And then in terms of understanding the sources, um, some of the land cover indicators, our, our urban or altered lands, because um, we know that those correlate well with water impairments. And also in the chat, um, Zach Bunnell asked um, if the source track down will focus solely on point source pollution. So no, we're definitely going to be incorporating these land cover indicators. Um, and then some of the, so that those use a lot of the data that already exists. So we want to kind of extract the value out of the, the land cover. Um, but then some of the things I mentioned that we're working on that don't really exist yet, um, we'll be looking at the functional riparian buffer size and also wetland function. So we can get a sense of um, how the ecology is functioning in that area. And then also, um, build out. And so that kind of gets back to what Mike was talking about, like in areas that may have less opportunity to make changes. So um, trying to get a sense of the build out in statewide. Yeah, absolutely. And that's such an important, um, such an important indicator. Um, so, you know, Bob, you kind of look at it from the reverse, right? We, NJ Rap's going to show us a bunch of stressors and opportunities. That's my sincere hope, um, and it's going to communicate it in a very uh, understandable way. But you usually race in when there's um, an acute issue and do the track down. And I think hearing from you a little bit about um, how we identify, for example, infrastructure issues contributing to water quality, because that's often the culprit, um, will help us to build NJRAP as well. So can you can you talk a little bit about how those um, infrastructure issues contribute to our water quality? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when it comes to infrastructure, one, I, I mean, we talked about, you know, the MS4 and stormwater 
You know, that land use and what you see running off through some of these outfalls at times when we do this work, if we see data that we know is bad, bacterial or, or for a beach, and we know that it's due to a wet weather condition, we will go and look and find and sample under those different conditions of the first flush. And typically what you see is the flow that will come out of these that carry contaminants can, can be incredible and the bacteria levels could be high. Um, so if, for an example, the stormwater infrastructure certainly contributes what's on land coming out. I think there's a secondary part of, of infrastructure that has happened in coastal communities and, and in sewer communities is where there may be infrastructure issues in the sanitary system and it, it overlaps and impacts the stormwater system in, in a mechanism of you have a lot of inflow and infiltration, the pipes are old and there's cracks up at the top of the pipes, not necessarily at the bottom. And we have found in many times uh, for pathogens that when you get that inflow and infiltration, we're seeing it actually make it through the ground, underground where you visibly don't see it, that is finding its way from a sanitary system into a stormwater collection system and making it to the water. So the, the, the key is, is to start from your impairment and work your way back in. Start on the big scale. If it's a watershed scale, you could spread out sampling across that watershed. So if you're concerned with, say, phosphorus in a stream, the idea would be spread that out throughout the watershed, get samples throughout, spread apart on that watershed. And if you know it's linked to rainfall, do it under those rainfall conditions and say, where do the high levels originate from? If you have 10 stations that might originate from number five above. So now you just keep narrowing your focus to exactly where those are. So it can work on a small scale. And it can work on a large scale, but typically a lot of what we see in the more developed areas is that that stormwater impact from that infrastructure. But it could be a little of both. Bob, Sanitary Bob. affecting, you know, the stormwater. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and we all know our infrastructure, wastewater and stormwater is very old. And um, so I think it helps us to prioritize when we and identify those problems that are really are acute and we we need to deal with now um, and, as and, opposed and, to and a, an asset management plan that's a little and and, and i think there's yeah. there, there there there's a twofold approach and i think that's what this this nj rap is going to be really good at is you have the longer term bigger scale you know impairment issues in the integrated report well if this area is impaired and it and and you can whittle down over time when we revise it to saying we have a phosphorus impairment or a specific pathogen impairment. It's it the, the clear thing on that pyramid I have is clearly identify the impairment you're trying to address because you you have to from that monitoring perspective. What is the concern? And historically in work we've done, we've piggybacked pathogen work where we're doing things with nutrient work and said, let's collect nutrients from those same stormwater outfalls while we're out there, because we have the lab here. And we did that, and lo and behold, a lot of times what we see, the highest pathogen contributors were also the highest nutrient contributors. So there was an overlap. So sometimes, you know, from a monitoring perspective, identifying something that you really want to target to, to rectify might actually get you more than just one thing. And and this is a question really for anyone. Um, what are the technologies that will help us do this, or or are there any emerging technologies that are particularly exciting? I mean, we we saw the little uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it it was an amazing little boat, remote control yeah, boat. Yeah, the high cat. <laughs> the high yeah. hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the high cat is. The I I, cat. I think a lot of the emerging things are things that have been out there over time, from my viewpoint, that have been very beneficial in yeah. in doing these track down. Is one there there there's all kinds of suites of continuous sensors. Um, th those can be calibrated, deployed, left out for for weeks. <laughs> under all kinds of conditions that can help you characterize things that might tell you what impacts and changes you might see under different conditions that could be used as a surrogate to where do you go do intensive monitoring with people. So by, by being able to calibrate deploy things, there's also things we've used them over the years 
a lot of different groups have used them for different reasons, but ISCO automatic samplers. You, 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 you can get the simple one without the costly refrigerated one where you can put ice in the middle. You can deploy these. You can program them to set out and collect samples every hour or two hours from multiple locations and either have them trigger on flow level or have them trigger on a specific time and date. So you could sample a whole large watershed area like we did nitrate in the Passaic. We covered, you know, a 15 mile area by deploying these spread apart, all starting at the same time of day, all collecting the same frequency, left them out for 48 hours, maintaining them just one day in between. That's and we got full is. nutrient profiles from those. So with, with having two people go out and deploy all, you know, six instruments out through a big area, we were able to get a hundred and, you know, 45, for nutrient results from all the different nutrient parameters over the same time, same yeah. spread apart. So it helps you determine where those higher loads are coming from. That's I see, very, you know, some of the comments of drones. Drones mm -hmm. will be, and remote sensing, clearly something we do from, from aircraft. Now, that that because we have that aircraft, we, we do it over those larger lakes, perhaps. We've been doing it along the coast since 2007. So there, there's a lot of those and other tools that I think are out there that are more on the assessment side are, you know, I, I know I shared it with a lot of people and, you know, over the years, but our, you know, rainfall website, it, it gives you a lot of points throughout the state that you have hourly rainfall and you have access to it within, you know, the most recent data within like an hour or two of the most recent data. So when you're looking at and it, it's all you know, archived back to 2000. So looking at the historic data, how it correlates, if you think it's a runoff issue, there's loads of data um, that's available. Yeah, that's that's very helpful. We are so such a data rich state. But I also kind of want to mention that, Mike, you had talked about um, our um, community scientists and how important they are. I do think there are some very user-friendly tools, and I want to give Gabe an opportunity to do a quick commercial for um, the um, app that that his shop uses for MS4 permittees, because I am a firm believer that if you are a municipality and you're feeling like um, it's going to be a challenge to inventory your infrastructure, you might just hand this app to your environmental commissioners and ask them to walk around and do it. So, Gabe, you want to just explain real, real quick what that app is and who gets sure. to use so, it? Sure. Yeah, we developed an ArcGIS online tool that you can use on your smartphone. Um, basically, you just download the ArcGIS collector app and we will loan you a license. If you don't have one, you do need an ArcGIS online license, but we have a pool of them to loan out. So you, you just can use your phone. You walk to the point of what it is. Let's say you're mapping st your stormwater inlets. You walk to your stormwater inlet and you just mark the point right there on your smartphone. You know, there's a couple of fields you fill in to tell it what it is. You know, OK, it's a stormwater inlet. There's other choices that are not mandatory, too, like you can put in the condition of it and when it last looks like it was maintained and other things that you can use to help, you know, manage your assets as well. But specifically, what we require you to do is mapping the point location. And then the, the cool thing about that is that also that information is fed right to us. You don't even have to then send us your map because we have that information directly. Mm -hmm. We have a layer on our website already that someone is, it, you know, it's only the information we have right now, but you could go on there on our ArcGIS or on our GIS website and download the layer. Just search for MS4. There's a handful of them. There's a layer for outfalls and inlets and everything that we have. And you can see where all of the MS4 infrastructure that we already have maps for is in the state. And we're planning to eventually using this app as well as you know, the paper maps that people have provided us in the past and digitizing them to just wind up with a, a map of all the stormwater infrastructure basically in the state. Which I think is so critical. We, you know, how could we possibly craft solutions if we don't understand where the water is, is, um, yeah. is flowing? It's, it, it, it's operating blind. And I also think that um, there are uses for that particular data layer well beyond HABs and, and, um, you know, emergency management, there's a, there's a million reasons to have better data. Um, we just need to make it accessible. So thank you for that. Um, you know, once we have that kind of data 
And once we we start to improve our water quality, I firmly believe that there's some um, financial benefit. And I think, Mike, you touched on it, um, the idea of a regional and watershed approach, because the department, we are very sensitive to the fact that all of this climate change, a pandemic, water quality accountability, PFAS, it's all coming down at once. And mm -hmm. while we can't change that, um, and, you know, and we can't not address it. That is also not acceptable as an answer. Um, you know, we, we can sympathize and we can try to help uh, municipalities find optimal solutions. And of course, we can offer uh, grant and loan opportunities. But Mike, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the financial benefits of a regional approach? Yeah, so I, I think one of them is, is just that there are going to be communities that do not have the space. They're fully built out. They are built out. They were built out before the 1980s where we did stormwater management uh, and going back to retrofit or create projects in spaces, you know, in streets is going to be extremely expensive. But there are upstream communities, you know, that are rural or less developed that have much greater opportunities at a lesser cost. You know, as Gabe said, can can we plant trees along the stream to deal with temperature? Can we restore the riparian zones? Um, you know, less cost and pulling resources. So there are a lot of communities, as we all know, that don't have their own engineer, that don't have their own planner. So they have consultants. So some of these consultants, you know, work for neighboring towns. So if you're doing a regional approach, you're using one consultant and they're spreading the cost. But there are some towns that have their own staff. And by doing a regional approach, you're sharing those burdens, those costs, uh, and providing a benefit to the entire region. You're also taking a bunch of community activists, whether it's the EC members, the green team members, the shade tree commissions, and pulling those thoughts, those resources, that that local knowledge in developing a, a solution. So I think I think there are multiple ways where this provides some benefits. Yeah, and some cost savings for sure. Um, and yeah. you know what you were talking about, um, sort of working with another community to take actions that impacts your water quality. We're seeing that at the state level. I was, we were on a call with EPA to discuss that integrated approach where there are some flexibilities as long as the, the standard is met. You know, we'll, we'll talk about how you get there and which permittee um, undertakes the action uh, as, as Gabe descri described. And I believe it was Delaware who was paying Pennsylvania to do some um, mm -hmm. restoration work so that the water quality coming downstream was improved. Um, and that's a really, to me, interesting approach. I think also when you talk about urban watersheds, uh, that is why the department is uh, hoping to propose a rule that will address reconstruction statewide. Because at the end of the day, um, we can put all the stormwater controls that we want on new development, but much of the problem is undermanaged or unmanaged stormwater. And so without that, we do not improve our urban communities. And, and that is something that I feel really strongly about. Um, we also don't do this. Uh, you know, without um, without funding. So I'd love to hear what types of solutions you're seeing, um, both in the watershed uh, approach and as targeted um, fixes, uh, Paul, with your team. Like, are you seeing some of these innovative approaches come across your, I mean, you talked about sewering. That's amazing. That's an amazing solution. But are there other uh, solutions that are being put forward through your program? Um, we haven't seen it in a while, but <clears throat> the water bank does fund open space preservation as well. Um, any clean water benefit that's associated with preserving open space, farmland, um, we can participate in that. Yeah, I mean, that's, the, the, go ahead. I no, was just going to say that, that to me, if you look into these underlying open space documents across the state, there's a lot of talk about a green belt. And my challenge to municipalities across the state is find your blue belt. Go ahead, Paul. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I was just going to add that um, the 
I guess the hurdles that we face is that our borrowers have to be municipal municipalities, counties, um, <clears throat> and they have to own the infrastructure or the or the project that um, they're implementing. But other than that, if they have any type of project that addresses water quality, we can find an eligibility for it and, and implement the project. All right, thanks. And I think we heard earlier that flooding is tied to this, and that is an issue that everyone is standing up and paying attention to. I, you know, I sit on a lot of calls with our state floodplain administrator, and he talks about, uh, I believe, a particular intersection in in uh, Flemington that flooded, had several car rescues in one night. No river nearby. None. So I think getting a handle on this issue is important for so many different reasons. Um, all right, I'm going to do a bit of a, a lightning round here with everyone um, because I love this question. This is how good policy is made. It starts with this question, um, basically asking you, you know, what would you do if I if I handed you a um, a magic wand? What what does ideal water quality management in the future look like? What kind of data would you have? What kind of participation? What kind of policies? And so I'm going to start with Kate. <laughs> okay, um I have I have two. One is like super in the weeds because that's what I've been working on is just getting all of the data aligned. So like the stormwater quality standards um need to be aligned with the types of data we have because it's actually not built on our authoritative stream network. So it just it's just like an unnecessary barrier. So getting getting all the data aligned um, and then super big picture, um, looking at smart growth solutions to water quality, because there's a lot that just focusing on water quality on its own, we miss out on a lot of big picture and uh, co-benefits type solutions. All right, thank you. And um, I guess I'm going to go to Bob next. It's it, interesting question. I think those were those were good answers. I will take a little approach from a different side. Think things that I've noticed that I think we could get the most benefit out of is the the lack of coordination and collaboration between levels of of, of different levels of government, the community with the government. The I, I think a lot of the times there's more of a headbutting that that goes on than there is about a collaboration. And I think when we get down to it, everybody wants to see the same thing. It's just how you get there. And sometimes there's an approach that I've seen where, you know, the initial response is my water is bad and we need to fix the water quality and it's the municipality's fault. Um, and and I, I've heard that a lot and I've been at meetings where I've I've changed things a little bit in the philosophy where I was able to tell those groups, we have to remember as the community that lives in that town, we're the ones that are contributing to it. So you, you can't make a solution if you're butting heads and fighting against each other because it's going to take them working collaboratively to get that done and to make it last. Because as a state agency, I will tell them, I'm here to help you find where the problems are originating from, but without the locals taking ownership of it, the minute it gets fixed and we leave, if you guys don't keep up with it and pass that on, it's not going to last. You can revert back. So things that I've seen have been more along those lines and an ideal world would see more of that collaborative effort because I think that answers to the funding source too. If you have limited funding, which we all know there's only so many funds, if people are working together collaboratively, that money's going to go a lot further. And that includes the use of our community and citizen science, which we've used to get us more data when we needed it in areas. We've collaborated, we've worked across and have engaged people across the board. And I think that is one of the, the biggest issues that I see to, to make those improvements and to make improvements less. I could not agree with you more. And when you, I, I would just underscore that by saying when you look at the regional and, and um, community solutions that have been successful, that's how it gets done. Absolutely. Sort of 
letting the data be the great equalizer, make it neutral, sit in the same room and figure it out. So I think yep. I love that answer, Bob. Um, Paul, what's your magic wand look like? If I had a magic wand, <laughs> I would have unlimited funding with no yeah. strings attached for <laughs> all water infrastructure improvements. That's probably not going to happen. Yeah. But as I said before, that the $60 million appropriation from the state we got for the last three years is pretty much that. It's it's um, It has strings, but we can be more uh, creative and flexible with the use of those funds. So what what we'd like to do with the water bank moving forward is is try to use more of that those funds for for planning and and getting ahead of the capital projects and not necessarily having it have to be tied to a capital project and also as bob said more more collaboration and um working across and among municipalities and counties to to address the the optimal solution to the problem um also also an amazing answer and i you know I use a lot of imagery. It's how I think. And, you know, whether it's New Jersey RAP or or the regulations, what I love to do is think of building our policies out of Legos so that we can build on them. And I think that's what the Water Bank is doing too, in the way that they fund. They're making sure that we're funding projects that can lead to the next project. And I think that that is so important. Um, so thanks, Paul, for that answer. Gabe, your turn. I'm handing you the wand. Yeah, so this is obviously a pretty complicated question. Um, the way I'm looking at it is really holistically. I think in the far distant future, we could have water quality flooding at driven requirements. So rather than and, and based on your specific watershed, right, that's adopted then through water quality management planning program, probably to make it enforceable. And, and that way you can have specific requirements that address your watershed. Does it make sense for everyone to reduce the peak flow rate of the two year storm by 50% whenever they do a development? I mean, if everyone in the whole watershed does that, then it doesn't really have any benefit because now they're all discharging at the same time. So, I mean, you can you, you can come up, and it's obviously super complicated, but you can come up with individual studies in every watershed to be able to figure out, okay, when should you discharge your stormwater to avoid having any impact? What specific water quality issues do we have in this watershed that you should address? 80% TSS removal is great and removes a lot of other pollutants, but it doesn't specifically address anything that doesn't adhere to TSS. And that might be what is the cause of impairments in your community. So I think, you know, we can get there eventually. And that's kind of what we're doing with the watershed improvement plan in a way. Like if you look at our MS4 permit right now, we have a bunch of requirements in there for street sweeping and cleaning your inlets and what you do at your municipal maintenance yard and all these various things that are intended to address pollutants, but they're generic and apply to everyone. So when you do your watershed improvement plan, you're going to actually figure out what are the problems we have in our community, how are we impacting those things, and then what can we do to solve them? And then at the end of the day, maybe in 10 years when these plans are implemented i don't need to tell someone hey you need to do, do this street sweeping in your ms4 permit because they're already addressing those problems through the things they develop through their watershed improvement plan and so really they've developed their own almost individual ms4 permit to address in their watershed and that to me is that is the beauty of better data and more data and technology because 20 years ago we would have just said that is not even feasible. It's too hard. It's why we write our regulations kind of one size fits all out of necessity. And so I, I couldn't uh, agree with you more, Gabe. We, we need to, you know, I, I've been at this for a long time. Um, I was in um, land use way back when, when the Highlands got passed and even before that. Um, and we were talking about implementing TMDLs through land use permits back then. Data is how we get there. So I'm really excited about that and I'm excited about the amount of data and making it accessible because also if it's inaccessible to local decision makers, um, that's that's not helpful. <laughs> so Mike, you're going to you're you're the last person to hand oh, the wow. wand to. Uh, probably going to regret giving me the wand. Um, you know, when I started off my 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 short presentation, you know, I went back to the Clean Water Act and the goal of restoring and enhancing our water. And we were supposed to eliminate all discharges of pollutants into navigable waters by 1985. You know, and you know, and then as we all acknowledge, our environmental regulations is really about 
sort of slowing the degradation, not reversing. So from a top, from all levels, you know, when we just make a decision, it should be, are we improving water quality? Are we reducing flooding? Or are we just not making it that much worse? And so our, our thought process needs to be different. How are we going to improve? Because we have those legacy issues. So from a zoning perspective, a planning board perspective, a DEP permit perspective, are we making it better? Yes, okay, then we can go forward. If we're not making it better, we need to go back to the drawing board. You know, so, and I think Katie, as, as you have said multiple times, NJ Rapp, uh, the integrated report being on ArcGIS, which I first really, really hated, um, all of the community science uh, that all the organizations do have it on, you know, story maps and ArcGIS makes that data very, very easy to access, makes it a lot easier to understand. Um, so using those tools to inform those decisions, are we making it better? Are we staying the same or are we degrading? And if we're not making it better, then the decision is no until we can reverse um, reverse that and modify the project. I think that is, and that's obviously a, we got, you know, decades to get here. Unfortunately, it'll probably take us decades to get back to those goals of 1972, but uh, that would be my world. I mean, I, I think if any of you have gone to any of the NJ PACT meetings, you have heard Vince Mazai, um, the state uh, floodplain administrator, say that at DEP, we are really trying to be cognizant in the way that we permit of not just holding back the tide, but also um, giving the appropriate uh, attentiveness to restoration. And I think you can see that in the in the funding that we're doing through 319. Um, but we're eager to um, to help others uh, lift that up at the local level and to help build capacity. And that's one of the things I keep har harping on is how can we help uh, the folks who are the front line of these decisions really understand and make better decisions? And how can we support that with with data, with training? Um, so that's, you know, that's my future, my my magic wand future is that we are making decisions that are informed by science and that are um, that the science is readily shared and understood and that everyone understands how their um, personal decisions as well as the, the municipal decisions and the, the local decisions, whether again, it's the shade tree committee or the open space committee who decides to acquire something. Um, how do we get all of that to work together and have everyone understand it? I personally think it begins in the schools. And so I'm thankful that um, uh, our New Jersey has a climate curriculum and we should all be asking our, um, our local districts how they're implementing that. I think um, there's a local teacher here who asks her students um, what they want to do when they grow up and then asks them to green that career. That's what it has to be. It can't just be the environmental uh, professionals who are getting this work done. It has to be everyone's job. And so we've got to bring that data in a meaningful way to them, which is why we are so jazzed about NJ Rap. But it is time for the audience to ask questions. So I'm going to hand it back to Chelsea. And I just want to thank the panelists. I think we, I hope that for the audience, we took some very distinct, discrete topics and kind of stitched them together um, to, to make the connections for water quality. And we know that our water quality is, is what um, is at issue with HABs. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, panelists. Um, so at this point, if you can click the raise your hand function and ask questions. We have a couple questions in the chat. Some of them have been answered. Some folks had more than one question. Perhaps you want to take this time and, and raise your hand and just ask, ask the panelists. So I will give everyone that opportunity now. All right, Fred, you're up. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, two uh, questions. I have one for Paul. Um, one, uh, Paul, I was curious if um, aeration or oxygenation would fall under th that equipment uh, for potential um, funding for any sort of uh, 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 low interest loan. 
Uh, it could, yes. It depends on the owner who who owns the equipment. If okay. it's a municipality, sure. Um, and right, it would have to get all the permitting and whatnot. But right, it would be eligible. Yep. Okay, thank you. And then my second question is for Gabe. Um, Gabe, I was curious. Um, so for, let me just use an example: Jefferson Township. So Jefferson Township, a portion of the municipality is in the Lake Hapakon watershed, but then they have other portions of the municipalities that are in other watersheds. With a PACCON, because the commission is there um, and they're part of a team and they have ATMDL and a restoration plan and they have a piece of that that can easily fall into an improvement plan. Um, I guess my question is, are they submitting, would Jefferson submit multiple plans for the multiple watersheds they're in? And if they are, are they submitting just their part or is it part of a larger plan that is submitted. I, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out if you have multiple watersheds, some may have TMDL, some don't. How, how is that going to be um, uh, submitted to you? Yeah, so I think it'll it'll depend on how exactly they want to tackle it. I, I, th I would be happy with either approach, I think. Um, particularly, I think it's better maybe if they do multiple, because if they're going to work together with the commission to do one around the lake, that should probably be a standalone plan and they prepare a separate one for the other watershed they have in town. But yeah, certainly there's gonna be a lot of communities that fall into this category. I mean, as we went through and looked at just the tier Bs, there are some that have, you know, 15 different Huck 14s that might be in the community. So yeah, I, I think one plan is certainly acceptable, but the projects you're talking about, the implementing in the second part of the plan, that needs to be broken down by which watershed are they in, which pollutant are you attempting to address? It still could all be part of one plan. It could be two plans if you wanna make it that way, um, particularly like if you're working with another community that's on the same watershed, that probably is how it'll wind up being. But um, if you're doing it on your own, it could be either way. Okay, thank you. Thanks for those questions, Fred. All right, Nancy. Hi, um, I have a question actually for, for Paul. Um, so I, in some instances, um, May perhaps stormwater, non-point source pollution-based projects um, that would also affect, um, say, drinking water reservoirs or source water for potable water. Um, how would, and I don't know if there's precedent for it, um, how would the, uh, the water bank approach um, a project where there's clearly clean water benefit, um, but also safe drinking water benefit. And has there been any consideration of sort of the uniqueness of um, uh, projects that would be based on stormwater quality, um, you know, as an incentivizer to put forth projects into the, you know, into the water bank? Um, you know, we've typically seen potable water, drinking water, um, and of course, uh, wastewater based point, you know, point source pollution uh, projects. But just curious to hear um, if there's been any consideration or um, sort of thinking that really um, when it comes to non-point source pollution, there could be some projects, um, say the controlling of HABs um, in a reservoir where it does touch both water quality and drinking water. Um, yeah. Generally, we we look at it as a clean water project because it's non-point source, even though it, it may be affecting a potable water supply. Um, and generally, we have um, more funding availability and, and better options to provide principal forgiveness and that sort of thing on the clean water side. Okay. So. It's hard when it's all really connected. <laughs> right. Yeah, and who, who's the owner of the the yeah. land where the, the stormwater controls are going on? If it's a private water company, we couldn't fund it under the clean water. Right. So yeah. if, if if that's the issue you're thinking about, we'd have to look it into it a little further. Yeah, yeah. Um, not not specifically, but just, um, you know, what comes to mind is, um, you know, particularly related, related to haves, you know, um, which are, you know, it there. There's of course their clean water. You know the clean water issue with it, but um, you know owners of drinking water treatment facilities, um, you know, have um, a stake 
in controlling HABs as well. It, it protects their source water and protects the treatment that they're doing. Yeah, I think we're I think we're going to hear more about that in detail um, later this afternoon. Um, that certainly is something that everyone can rally around the public health implications, which are becoming, um, you know, the, the distance between those dots are is getting shorter and shorter, which is why I'm confident that we'll be able to address these these issues. Um, Julia, I think, had her hand up, but put it yes, back I, down. I do. No, <laughs> yep. sorry not using the equip the uh, technology properly. Um, I'm a big believer in the value of stormwater utilities, um, but we don't have any in New Jersey yet. And in fact, it's been my observation that as we make um, monies available to communities through, through uh, the programs that the department is running, it sort of gives towns almost an excuse to be able to say, look, we're addressing the issues we don't need to create a utility. I'm wondering if there could be a link between availability of public funds through the water bank or any other tool uh, and whether or not a town has its own skin in the game as well or a region has its own skin in the game as well. Uh, I recognize this particularly for overburdened communities, that's probably not the um, the nexus that you should be making, but there's a lot of the state that I think could be part of this. And it may be that the MS4 permits are the way to really engage communities because they're going to have to start coming up with their plans um, and how are they going to fund them. But I guess a link between publicly available funds and whether or not a town has skin in the game through a stormwater utility or whatever way they want to have skin in the game, I think you know, would yeah, be actually, We certainly, um, that is something that we have tossed around as an idea. You know, um, you probably know that we are trying to um, help some communities do a technical feasibility study and one of the thoughts that we have is once you've once you've shown that you're invested in going that that further i would i would not be surprised if we don't give priority to those groups um with subsequent funding and that's something that we continue to uh talk about both in paul's shop and in um in our watershed protection uh shot shop in the 319 area you know how do we build it out of Legos. How do we get folks to um, really look at the data, figure out what the solutions are, and if if the right solution is a stormwater utility, help them along through the process with some sort of prioritization. So I, I really appreciate um, hearing that thought that we've been tossing around validated. <laughs> well, a billion dollars yeah. might sound like an awful lot of money to people, but Paul will be, the, I'm sure, the first person to tell you it's a drop in the bucket of what's necessary. Correct. Yeah, our need is is much greater than that billion dollars. Right. Julia, I think what you, you said a little bit earlier, I think when these projects start being built, so maybe the 2028 permit is when towns really start to get serious about the MS4, uh, the stormwater utilities, because they have to figure out how to fund the development and the maintenance of these things. And I think I think we'll start to see a lot larger uptake. Right. Maybe even slightly before that, right? Like as they start putting together the second phase of their plan, coming up with the projects, and then we have the requirement mm -hmm. there in there for them to give us an idea of how they're going to fund it, they might start looking at the total cost of all these things and say that that's the only way we possibly could. Yeah. Yeah. Bob, you would need an old raincoat to wear as well to carry that off. A absolutely. A little cigar. <laughs> Maybe a fedora. Oh, you could play trivia and name that actor. Peter Falk. <laughs> okay, so. Are you, are you seeing is, my, my yeah, slide? Yeah, I, I can okay. see your slides. I'm just going to give folks like one more minute because I, I think some folks 
I see rapid jumping on right now, so we'll just give one more minute, but your slides are up. Okay, good. And everything looks great. Let's give one more minute. seeing some people jump back on. All right, I hope everyone had a great lunch. Welcome back. This afternoon we are going to start with a series of case studies. So our session three is called It's Complicated Cause Analysis Case Studies and our first speaker is Dr. Jason Adolph, a marine mm -hmm. science professor from Monmouth University who will be presenting a case study on Deal Lake. Yeah, hi, and uh, thank you, Chelsea, and, and everybody for having me today. I'm very excited to be sharing our work on Deal Lake and uh, coastal lakes in, in general. Um, oh, no. Okay, there we go. So coastal lakes are a natural feature of the coastal plains of New Jersey that were historically had an open connection to the ocean. Here, uh, Great Pond is what we call Deal Lake nowadays along the Monmouth uh, County coastline. Uh, this is Lake Takanasi, and historically these were important environments for anadromous fish spawning events, and they still are to some extent, and of course very popular sites for recreation. Uh, New Jersey's changed, of course, since the 1800s. We're now the most populated, uh, densely populated state in the nation, especially in including the area where coastal lakes are found. So uh, coastal lakes are, of course, not as pristine as they used to be. They now exist in a highly urbanized to suburbanized watershed along the Jersey Shore, uh, surrounded by lots of people. And if you've been to that area, you, you know what I'm talking about. They are still connected to the ocean, uh, mostly, mostly, mo mostly through uh, engineered structures like flumes and pipes that run be beneath streets and beaches that connect, uh, in most cases, a two-way connection between the coastal lakes, like Deal shown here, and the ocean swimming beaches. My group has been using um, these lakes as a, a system for addressing hab dynamics uh, because one of the things we've noticed about these lakes as they're peppered along the coastline here is how different they can be. And that's illustrated by what the different colors of water look like coming out of lakes on the same day, um, even though they're really close to each other. So you can get very different dynamics in the lakes, um, even though they're adjacent to each other. And that, that makes for a good experimental system for studying things like habs. I'm not going to talk about a lot today, but we also run a community based participatory um, research program. I'm going to really shortcut this. This is a whole other talk. It would just take too much time. This has been going on for four years now. Uh, it involves citizen samplers at all different lakes. We have a, a shiny app where we return their data to them in tabular and graphical form. And one of the big things that's come out of this is that the citizen scientist data has allowed us to really measure and describe the sensitivity of different lakes to rainfall. And I will come back to that point later on. So in our lab side of the project, um, one of the things that's different among these lakes is the harmful algal bloom cyle year to year. And I'm showing four years of phycocyan and fluorescence. This yellow line here indicates the HAB threshold, which is a, a calibrated estimate based on the DEP thresholds. And you see that in Deal Lake during the warm months that are the red colors on the line, every year about the beginning of July, there's a harmful algal bloom that, that forms, whereas in other lakes like, like Lake Takanasi down here in Long Branch, we've never in the time that we've been observing seen a harmful algal bloom form. Now, um, here I'm showing all years traces of phycocyanin or the HAB index for all lakes. You see some are above the line, the HAB threshold line, and some never cross it, like Como and Sylvan and Rec Pond here. And I, I figured let's use this data to, to make a metric of how um, HAB prone lakes are. In other words, let's count up of all the days we've sampled these lakes over the four years. What percentage of days do we find those lakes in a state of having a HAB? And that sorts the lakes out into Sunset, Deal, and Fletcher. 
where you have upwards of 10 to 20 percent of days they're in a, a harmful algal bloom state from these four years of sampling and other lakes like Takanasi, Sylvan, Wesley and Rec Pond where we basically never observed a HAB occurring. And that again underscores the differences among these lakes, but also begs the question, um, can we figure out what's different between these lakes that causes this kind of difference? And I think that's an important, important basic thing. Uh, if we map these lakes, the ones that are more HAB prone are right in Asbury Park. And no, I don't really think rock and roll causes HABs. Um, I think it's probably more related to the watershed and the other uh, ensuing water quality properties. So we did start uh, uh, quantifying watershed characteristics for each individual lake, and we factored that into our um, into our uh, research program that I'm go going to go into uh, next. But uh, I do want to make the point that although these lakes are small, they're they're around very very dense populations and expose a lot of people potentially to the hazards of harmful algal blooms. And I think that's the big importance, the public health issue surrounding HABs in these coastal lakes. How many people <clears throat> and pets are exposed to them? So I'm going to go into the weeds now and the research side of things. This is a matrix of our data inventory. We've collected lots of indicators of biomass, water quality, nutrients that the NJDP uh, analyzes for us and qPCR samples in these different lakes shown down here um, on a number of different projects over four years. We also bring in rainfall data from the National Weather Service uh, multi-center precipitation estimator. And as I mentioned, watershed data from my colleague um, Jeff Puad and the student Sydney Lucas at uh, Monmouth University. Uh, Sydney now works for the New, New Jersey DOT, actually as a GIS specialist. Um, the research questions that drive what we do <clears throat> include understanding how the lakes differ from each other based on what we've measured and what environmental factors drive that. And I'm going to cover only those two today for the sake of time. The other questions that we're interested in that I'm not going to cover are, are how does the, the quality of water in the lakes impact adjacent ocean, ocean beaches? And also, uh, what can we do about predicting HABs in this system? Uh, both spatially and, and temporally. I'm happy to talk about both of those things uh, later on. Email me or uh, in the chat session. Um, but I'm going to cover point one and two primarily at first. So what I'm showing you here is the median value for each lake of all the things that we've measured over the four years we've been measuring. And I'm showing this intentionally as a confusing and overwhelming uh, uh, slide because the point I want to make is that if we want to use all these parameters, to ask the question, do lakes differ from each other? We need to be able to re reduce this data into a manageable set. And the way you do that statistically is through clustering methods such as principal components analysis. And I'm not going to go into the statistical details on that, but what it does is it allows you to take a complex, uh, broad data set like this and condense it down into factors that might tell you if lakes are similar or different from each other. This is the output from that analysis, a pr principal component analysis where um, and what we're looking at is in in the space of the variability of all that data I just showed you. In two dimensions, the dots are individual samples and those samples are colored for which lake they came from. If lakes are similar to each other based on the environmental parameters that we measured, they would cluster together. So you'd see clusters of like colors together on this plot, um, which we do. Rec Pond is a high salinity area in yellow here. You've got Sunset Lake and Deal Lake out here, separate from Wesley Lake over here. The arrows tell us which environmental parameters are so associated with those clusters. So things on this side of the graph are associated with high phycocyanin and total phosphorus. Over here with high DIN, which is a, a definite characteristic of Wesley Lake. And like I said, high salinity for, for um, Rec Pond down here. There is information about the details of what uh, all this within the PCA, but I'm not going to go into that here, and that's what's summarized here. This is two dimensions, and this is three dimensions, and I show this graph because it's a cool three-dimensional rotating scatter plot primarily that's neat to look at, but it also allows us to see much better how the lakes cluster out from each other according to those um, parameters we looked at. If we add a third dimension, and that third dimension 
uh, does contain primarily watershed based data. So it's the watersheds is one of the very important things that separates these lakes from each other. They're, they're little micro watersheds. You can see that very well here on the PC3 axis. So to, to wrap this part up, we are able to differentiate these lakes based on a number of factors, including HABs, nutrients, and watershed characteristics. And I think this is important because as we think of restoration strategies for these lakes, they should be informed by the different syndromes associated with each lake uh, and, and the di different objectives that we want to do. Obviously, not all lakes are going to be um, restored to prevent HABs because some of them don't even have them and others do. So let's now focus on deal and sunset lakes. Um, I'm going to highlight a research paper that uh, we published uh, students from Monmouth and Rutgers and staff from NJDEP about the, the seasonal nutrient cycle in Deal Lake. One of the things we found was that among these different stations, you see very different water quality um, elements, more inorganic nutrient up here and more particulate nutrient accumulating down here in the eastern basin. Um, we also found the seasonal variation that during the warm period, DIN or inorganic nitrogen, the nitrogen food that feeds halves, is very low in the in the lake, while phosphate, the inorganic phosphorus that feeds halves, is very high. And that switches as you move from summer high temps to low temp winter. There's lots of DIN in the lake and very little phosphate in the lake. This is also reflected in nutrient bioassays where we see HAB biomass um, is phosphorus limited. It grows more when you add phosphorus in the winter, but it really grows more in the summer during a bloom when you add nitrogen. That's because these blooms are sitting, they're bathed in excess phosphate in a nitrogen depleted environment when a bloom is happening in that environment. Um, continued sampling of Deal Lake has um, backed up what we published in that paper. Here's the HAB series for Deal Lake, and this is the inorganic nitrogen uh, trace here, high in the winters, low in the summer, and the phosphate trace here, phosphate high in the summers, low in the winters. So that trend has continued. And this, uh, what, what we think is going on is that there's an internal store of phosphate in the sediments that's bound during the summer, during the winter, but then during these the summertime when a bloom forms and things go anoxic and reducing in the sediments, that phosphate is released. And that's a piece of chemistry that's been well described in other, in other lake systems. So that we think there's internal phosphate that gets released during the HAB season to help fuel these blooms. We've also found relationships between rainfall and nutrients in Deal Lake in another project uh, uh, I'm doing with Robert Newby and, and other collaborators as part of a DEP project, um, and that is in the summertime, the amount of nitrate at different stations in Deal Lake can be uh, correlated with the amount of rainfall that's occurred over the last seven days. And this is really obvious here for DL3. It's it's present in a bunch of, of the stations, but not at Sunset Lake, interestingly. Um, but this is the best example here for the amount of rain that's fallen over the last week helps we can really predict pretty well how much nitrate is in is in that station. And I think the reason we're seeing this in summer is because you're starting from very low nitrate concentrations in the water already. Uh, now let's just see this relationship. But I do think this occurs year round. I think when rain enters these lakes, it brings with it nitrate, uh, nitrogen, um, and probably phosphorus also, but um, we're not seeing that in the data we are seeing the, the nitrate effect. So to start to wrap up, I think of HABs as a recipe kind of, because recipes require certain ingredients and res recipes require sequencing as well. So we look in grandma's little black book of recipes here for HABs and for Coastal Lakes HABs, because it's gonna be different from system to system. Here's the recipe that I'm seeing. Um, you start with an urbanized watershed with a low percent of wetland in it. That was something that came out of the principal components analysis. Um, a lake that's preloaded with bound inorganic nitrogen that, or phosphate that's not available in the in the uh, win winter. 
a wet winter or spring that brings in uh, nitrogen from the watershed, but not too much to wash the lakes out. And then it certainly seems to help in these coastal lakes if the rain turns off midsummer to produce a nice hot, dry growing season. Habs tend to do best, especially species like microcystin at above 25 degrees Celsius, and we definitely see those temperatures in the, in the lake. The formation of HABs shades the bottom and allows for the release of the bound dissolved inorganic phosphorus, which feeds the, the, um, the HABs even further. And then if we sprinkle in occasional summertime rainstorms on the order of one to two inches per week, so that's not a heavy rainfall, that's gonna give pulses of nitrogen to those HABs to sustain their growth and their biomass. Then if call, of course you, you you bake and you call DEP, put up signs and mind yourself and your pets. And I do want to make the point that these are not drinking water reservoirs. These are um, these are um, more recreational areas. So maybe that's obvious, but of course we don't want to make HABs. We want to stop HABs. So we can look at a recipe like this, a sequence and think, what can we control? And what can't we control? And what is climate change going to exacerbate? So to conclude, um, Sunset Deal and Fletcher have the most HABs in this in the system. They also tend to have less wetlands in their watershed and high TN and TP per throughout the year. I didn't cover that very uh, closely. Um, our data shows that these coastal lakes are highly sensitive to rainfall on a short time period. And I think Bob mentioned earlier about understanding how sensitive your system is to rainfall as, as an important um, factor. And that's the kind of data that we're we're finding, I think, is useful for lake restoration strategies, uh, understanding what each uh, municipality is dealing with. And I thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jason. That was uh, really informative. A lot of great work happening there. Um, at this point in time, if you have any questions um, for Jason, please put them in the chat. And at the end of the three sessions, we will have a mini Q&A session. So um, at this point, I am going to introduce coming back Vic Peretti again, who will be presenting a case study on the Millstone River. And again, if you have questions for our presenters as they're going, just be sure to put them in the chat. They can go ahead and answer them as we go. Additionally, we can get to them um, during the Q&A. So, Vic? Okay. Um, we'll... can see your slides, Vic. Okay, so I'm going to be uh, talking about a uh, tab we had on the Millstone River uh, this summer, uh, which presented two challenges. Uh, one, a hab in uh, moving water and a very real concern for drinking water contamination. And you know, thinking to what Jason had said and a couple other presenters about the uh, importance of rainfall and how it affects habs, well, we kind of had the opposite issue right, on the Millstone. Is kind of the drought conditions that were the most significant. I'll get into that during the presentation. So we discovered the HAB uh, July 21st in 2002 along the Millstone River while we were conducting routine sampling uh, on Route 518 at the route at, uh, at the Millstone. And I just want to point out uh, for those who may not know our, our HAB program is a response program uh, meaning that we don't necessarily go out and see cabs. And luckily, we happen to be sampling some routine stream sites at this location when we discovered the HAB. And what we found through observations when we were out sampling it was tracked along a nine mile stretch uh, from about Carnegie Lake in Princeton downstream to the Raritan confluence. So we sampled. Uh, several sites along this stretch to confirm the HAB level. We did confirm uh, there was a drinking water intake downstream. Uh, so the extent of the HAB, the toxicity of it, the threat to drinking water compelled the need to track the source of both the HAB and what was feeding it. So this map shows the site's sample when the HAB was, HAB was first observed on in July. 
flow, uh, the water is moving from left to right. And note that drinking water intake is in the approximate area here in the pink triangle. Uh, the black crosses are permanent discharges that we investigated to see what exactly is in the area. On the left is Carnegie Lake. And the dot size is the relative concentration of the toxins the results, and I'll provide those in more detail in a little bit. Uh, but you kind of see Carnegie Lake, there was uh, definitely a HAB present, and it kind of grew in intensity throughout the millstone before dissipating again. So these are the HAB results from the initial sampling on 721. The bars in the graph are sites along the millstone from Carnegie Lake downstream, and it goes left to right. Uh, it's, so Carnegie Lake, we had a site on Route 518, a site at Griggstown, a site at Blackwell's Mills, and a site just below Royce Brook, which was the um, closest to the confluence of the Raritan. So a HAB was present in Carnegie Lake with toxins above the 2.0 microgram per liter microcystinous thresholds, and the cell counts were high as well. Uh, however, we saw a significant decrease in cell concentration just after the Carnegie Lake outfall, followed by an exponential increase. Toxins followed a similar pattern, exponentially increasing downstream before dissipating again. Uh, notably, the downstream location at Griggstown site, it's a center bar here. Uh, we saw the 12th highest toxin result to date since the program was started and the eighth highest cell count. And you can see on the uh, table here, the Carnegie Lake is considerably above the threshold of two, 6.64. Uh, Route 18, it rose to 50 and Griggstown, 417, which you can see is well, well above the 2.0 threshold, and then it started dissipating. So this was an unusual pattern, as most stream halves emanate from a lake and act more act like any other contaminant. Uh, that is uh, more concentrated at the source and then dissipating or diluting as you go downstream. So what we seem to uh, but this seemed to indicate that we were getting a second, more substantial concurrent bloom downstream in the, uh, in the millstone. So because of this unusual pattern, we performed a source track down study to characterize the nutrients that may have been feeding the HAB, as well as the HAB itself. So this is a, a map of the uh, phosphorus concentrations uh, along the millstone on our uh, source track down study. Uh, and what you see here again, the, the, the size of the dots are relative to the concentration. And again, what we found is there was some uh, phosphorus in the Carnegie Lake, but it increased exponentially right at this 518 site before dissipating again. And what we saw here was that the um, uh, concentration um, was uh, a, a lot higher than what the uh, surface, quarter, surface water quality standard was. These are the same sites, same day, but this is for toxin. And you can see that the toxin results more or less followed the same pattern as the as the um, uh, phosphorus results. So the the data enabled us to narrow down the source of the phosphorus that was the significant contributor feeding the HAB, as well as the location that the HAB was emanating from. And this is a graph of the the track down results for both uh, toxins and phosphorus. The blue is the toxins and the purple is the total phosphorus. We can see the toxin concentration pattern clearly corresponding with the phosphorus pattern. The phosphorus in the millstone is significantly above the 0.1 milligram per liter surface water quality standard uh, with the highest at route 518, which was 0.96 milligrams per liter. That's nine times the standard. Uh, and just to clarify, uh, 
in Fred's earlier presentation, he had a question about what the surface water quality standard was. And for lakes, it's 0.05. Uh, for streams, it's 0.1. So at this point, the millstone was kind of acting more or less like a lake. Uh, so if it was a lake, it's you know it's even more alarming that the that the phosphorus was this high. So this data um, from Carnegie Lake on down to Royce Brook uh, leads us to conclude that although Carnegie Lake did have a HAB, it wasn't a significant contributor for either toxins or uh, total phosphorus. And all the data point to the HAB and the millstone being generated by the phosphorus influx influx uh, separate from Carnegie Lake. Uh, so one question becomes, why didn't we see a HAB in years past under drought conditions? And this is, a, uh, for the most part, we just don't know. We started sampling for HABs in 2017. So, you know, likely under previous drought conditions and similar phosphorus, phosphorus conditions, there could have been a HAB on the millstone. We just don't have the data to show that in uh, years prior to 2017. Uh, but because still warm waters are a significant variable for HAB production, we believe that the HAB and the phosphorus concentration was heavily influenced by the drought conditions. Extreme low flows caused the stream to act more like a lake, like I've said. Uh, that is, it was a still warm condition, which is favorable to HABs. The flow at the um, peak of the HAB was most likely more effluent than actual stream at the time. So the phosphorus wasn't diluted as it usually is during normal flow conditions. Uh, this chart shows the flow conditions in blue and the um, phosphorus concentrations in orange. And you can see as the flow decreases, the phosphorus increases. And the same pattern was seen in the HAB occurrence. Uh, the most, the HAB uh, at its most intense was also at the highest phosphorus and the lowest flow in you know, this area starting in uh, July through September. And we also happen to be sampling Carnegie Lake as part of our routine uh, monitoring. And this also provided additional data as part of our source track down and supported our conclusion regarding the source of the TP, uh, uh, the source of the phosphorus and of the HAB, in that it wasn't, uh, that Carnegie Lake wasn't a significant contributor. And so we also uh, tracked down the cyanobacteria community uh, to see if there was any changes along the, the stretch of the millstone. Uh, most of our understanding in blooms come from um, planktonic events, meaning uh, in the water column. Uh, events in flowing water are rare, but have been well, well documented. Uh, so again, blooms usually start in one water body and move to another through the water column. Blooms begin to grow in low flow regions of flowing water or in shallow areas where temperature can increase. And globally, we see benthic events in more flowing water than planktonic events, meaning uh, benthic events that uh, cyanobacteria that are on the bottom uh, more like phytoplankton or rocks and on the sediment. They release toxins. That's when we see them in flowing water. We don't usually see uh, cyanobacteria that are most common in lakes in flowing water. Again, key nutrients and physical properties of the aquatic system are the driving forces in HAB development. Nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen are the two largest factor, which which usually phosphorus is the limiting nutrient. And through evolutionary adaptation, cells are good at acquiring nutrients and um, containing them in their cells. So you know, we could track the phosphorus in this way down the stream. Uh, and again, these are factors that support our conclusion that the HAB didn't emanate from a single source um, rather than it. Uh, it was a separate uh, event 
from what was happening in Carnegie Lake. And just to reiterate physical properties that we saw in the millstone, such as temperature, water stillness, uh, also affected the have in this case. Uh, so we looked at the cell concentrations along the, the stretch of the millstone, including Carnegie Lake, uh, and we found not just proportions of cells, but entire species were present or absent, depending on where the sampling occurred. A uh, visual indication of cells highlighted different species, even among the genera present. Um, so there are different species of microcystis at different sampling locations. And uh, so they were present at some locations and not at others. And uh, significantly, we saw uh, species that were in Carnegie Lake and not on the millstone and vice versa. So again, based on this cell sampling evidence, uh, this indicates that a sole source or bloom in it originating in one location and moving through the water column was not what was occurring for the millstone event. So uh, our conclusions, uh, based on the track down study, the nine mile long millstone have of 2022 was able to propagate because of low flow lake like conditions due to the drought and significant levels of total phosphorus being discharged to the millstone river. And we're now working with partners and investigating ways to decrease the phosphorus inputs and increase stream flow. Uh, monitor, we're monitoring at Carnegie Lake as well as Millstone, and that will continue throughout 2023. And we hope to identify a uh, HAB if it occurs again before conditions increase to the 2020, 2022 levels, so we can possibly take appropriate action before a threat to drinking water occurs. And um, I'd also like to add, we did begin sampling last week, and so far so good, uh, no HABs. In Carnegie Lake or along the Millstone at this time. And thank you. Thanks so much, Vic. Um, just a reminder if you have any questions for Vic, feel free to put them in the chat or at the end, we'll have a, another little QA. So to close out this session, we have Heather Desco, a senior watershed protection specialist at the New Jersey Water Supply Authority, who will be presenting a case study on Spruce Run Reservoir. All right, Thanks, you're so quick, Heather. I can already oh, sorry. see slides. You're, no, you're great. Fantastic. <laughs> so I can see your slides in regular mode. Now they are in presentation mode. You're good to go. All right, All right. good to go. Uh, great. Thanks so much, Chelsea. And thank you, everyone, for um, inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm going to go over the uh, cover the ins and outs of Spruce Run Reservoir from source watersheds to water supply and hopefully record time because um, that's a lot to cover. Um, so just a quick outline of the things I'm going to go over here. I'm going to provide a brief background um, and then cover some interesting things that we've learned about the reservoir's watershed, what happening, what's happening within the watershed, how that all moves downstream, and then some planned work that we have coming up. Spruce Run definitely fits the bill of a complicated cause analysis. It really is a quite a fascinating project to work on since many of the normal hypotheses don't quite seem to fit. Um, so bear with me as I take you on this investigative history of HABs at Spruce Run, uh, which might sound a bit crazy at times and a bit like a conspiracy rabbit hole, but I can assure you we have a lot of the brightest HAB minds in New Jersey working on this and our work is far from complete. So Spruce Run Reservoir is part of the Raritan Basin Surface Water Supply System that is managed by the New Jersey Water Supply Authority. The authority is tasked with operating and maintaining infrastructure related to water supply, specifically the three reservoirs, Spruce Run, Round Valley, and Manasquan Reservoir, and the 60-mile-long Delaware and Raritan Canal. My division, Watershed Protection, is tasked with source water protection in the watersheds that make up the Raritan and Manasquan Water Supply System. In the Raritan system, the authority provides raw water to water purveyors who then treat the water. And between the two systems, the authority provides water for approximately 2 million Central New Jersey residents. So Spruce Run Reservoir is located in Hunterdon County. It is the third largest reservoir in the state and is an 11 billion gallon inline reservoir with two major stream inputs, the Mohawkway Creek from the west and the Spruce Run Creek from the north. And these are the ins to Spruce Run Watershed. The out is the outlet tower, which eventually leads to the South Branch Raritan River in the southeast corner here, uh, that the authority controls this release out of the outlet tower. 
The other feature that I've highlighted here is the swim beach at Spruce Run Recreation Area on the north side of the reservoir, and there are also several boat launches within the park side as well. At this point, we don't have a lot of in-reservoir characterization data, uh, but we do know a lot more about the watersheds that are contributing to the reservoir itself. The Mahawkaway Creek has an NJDEP approved watershed restoration and protection plan, and the authority is also working to develop a watershed restoration and protection plan for the other watersheds that drain to Spruce Run Reservoir, the Spruce Run Creek, Willoughby Brook, and Rocky Run, and the reservoir itself. Spruce Run Reservoir has been increasingly plagued by HABs in recent years, since fall of 2018. Tributaries in both of the major, wa major watersheds that drain to the reservoir have also had blooms in recent years. Uh, Manny's Pond is in the Mohawkaway watershed and Crystal Springs is in the Spruce Run watershed. And due to the persistence and recurrence of the blooms in the reservoir since 2019, it is likely that both internal, which means from within the reservoir itself, and the external from the watershed's nutrient loads are providing a consistent nutrient source for the cyanobacteria. But which one? Or is it both? So as I said, recurrent and persistent are really the best words to describe the blooms at Spruce Run. We have visible scummy shoreline blooms uh, quite frequently throughout the summer, and these have been observed to vary throughout the day. The reservoir also often has a deep green color in the summer, and based on data that we've collected, we know that the blooms often actually sit a few feet below the surface of the reservoir most of the time. So they're not always at the surface where you see a visible bloom, it's just kind of lurking there underneath the surface. Spruce Run has also experienced blooms in all seasons, the most often in the summer and the fall turnover blooms, like you see in a lot of other water bodies, but we've also detected um, blooms in the winter, and we have had cyanotox cyanotoxins detected in the winter, and that has not been with high cell counts. It's been with somewhat low cell counts, but had high, high loads. Um, so the three types of cyanotoxins we've detected in Spruce Run are microcystins, anatoxin A, and saxotoxin. Um, so the watershed area that drains into the Spruce Run Reservoir is 27,000 acres, or 42 square miles. While most of the watershed lands are forested, urban and agriculture, which are in the pink and cream colors, make up a significant portion. The Mahawkeray Creek watershed does have slightly more agriculture and urban than the Spruce Run Creek watershed. And while agriculture is only 16% of the watersheds, the loading calculations indicate that agriculture is responsible for nearly 50% of the annual phosphorus load into the reservoir. And the authority has been working with agricultural partners like the NRCS for years on various implementation and cost share projects uh, for agricultural stormwater management. So what do we actually know about the watersheds? There has been a lot of data collected in and around Spruce Run Reservoir since it was constructed in the 1960s. A 1976 EPA report said the input stream nutrient levels were typical of an oligotrophic system, which means low in nutrients, and despite the reservoir being classified as eutrophic or high in nutrients and highly productive. The Spruce Run Creek is the larger watershed contributing more volume and sub subsequently more nutrient loading than the Mohawkaway or the other smaller tributaries. You can see from the graphs here that the phosphorus levels have actually been decreasing over time and that's likely due to the Clean Water Act and other modern stormwater management rules in the 80s and 90s that have actually cleaned up the waterways. Uh, neither of these watersheds have had base flow samples that exceed the total surface water quality standard. That's the 0 0.1 for rivers that Vic mentioned um, in recent years, and the levels have remained relatively low over time, but you can see a slight increase since about 2005. Nitrate nitrate levels are another component that can be linked to HABs, and they have also remained fairly stable over time in both of the input watersheds. The nitrogen fractions like you see here, can impact which species of cyanobacteria can dominate, as well as influence cyanotoxin production, which Fred mentioned earlier. So we're always asked, are HABs a new phenomenon, or has this been going on for a long time, and why does it seem so much worse now? So these results definitely show that it looks better than it did 50 years ago, but they're also from base flow, and storm flow also tells a different story, but that is much harder to monitor for. So Bob Schuster mentioned the uh, flyover program, and we have really seen the storms that have had a direct impact on the reservoir. These images are from the flyovers from the uh, remote sensing program from June 2019. You can see the yellow arrows are again the inflow, in, the inflow from the Mohawkway Creek. The State Park Beach is the red circles, and the blue square is the outlet towers. Um, it's really a fascinating story. So in June 2019, there had been several heavy rainfall events that happened every couple of days. And if you look, you can see it seems that the over the course of the days here that the we've seen higher signatures. Uh, you can almost track the bloom coming in from the Mohawkway Creek and then pushing over into the swim beach um, over the next couple of days um, due to prevailing winds. 
And we've consistently seen higher signatures on the flyovers from the Mahakaway side of the reservoir, which leads to more questions about what is happening in the Mahakaway watershed. If the Mahakaway is contributing less volume and loading than the spruce run, um, are the increased nutrient concentrations in the Mahakaway in recent years enough to see this pattern? So I'm going to add to it with another hypothesis, and this is algal loading, and I think Fred talked about this a little bit um, as well. So this is where a watershed is a source of an algal cells that get transported into the reservoir in a storm, um, and where bloom conditions are then more favorable to then grow. So that's with warmer temperatures, increased light and available nutrients, and slower velocity than the stream. So a typical pattern we see at Spruce Run is two to three days after a rain event, the reservoir has a visible bloom. And I mentioned earlier about the blooms in the ponds in both of the watersheds draining into the reservoir. Um, the Mahakaway, we only have a few data points to support this, but uh, the dominant ta cyanobacteria taxa in the Mahakaway Creek watershed at Manny's Pond has actually tracked to the Spruce Run swim beach um, for samples, the same dominant taxa about five days later. Um, the samples were taken five days later. Um, and also the thing about Spruce Run is that we take samples at multiple locations around the reservoir and they often have different dominant taxa, which may be influenced by algal loading from upstream in the watershed as well. So in reservoir monitoring in Spruce Run in recent years has really been an incredible team effort and I won't be able to get through all of these today. There have been a lot of projects where we've gathered bits of information and are really trying to piece these together to grab a clearer picture of the reservoir itself. Uh, so we have four plus years of off and on HAB, so that's a lot of data that we've collected. Uh, one of the most interesting pieces of the puzzle is that we have one year of nutrient samples um, that were collected as part of a larger project, um, but there is very little difference in the surface, which is the orange line, and the bottom samples uh, of total phosphorus concentrations, regardless of whether the reservoir is stratified or not. We had assumed that there would be um, Deeper, deeper water phosphorus levels would be higher, um, and that would indicate a higher nutrient load uh, due to the recurrence and persistence of the blooms within the reservoir, but these data seem to indicate otherwise. Uh, so to dive deeper into these investigations, you really have to even look beyond water samples themselves. Uh, this map shows a detailed bathymetric survey of the reservoir. I know John mentioned this, um, and thank you to DEP for gathering this data for us uh, for this updated bathymetric survey. This detailed depth map provides critical information for calculations that are required for reservoir volume, but also to select sampling sites. With funding that we have for the Watershed Restoration and Protection Plan uh, for the reservoir, we conducted reservoir sediment bottom, or bottom sediment testing using the deepest sections of the reservoir. And this effort gave information on the phosphorus, aluminum, iron, and calcium content of the reservoir bottom. The reservoir's internal phosphorus load was calculated as well, which is determined to be significant um, and the bottom sediments also have high levels of bioavailable forms of phosphorus. This is somewhat confusing because the water column data do not indicate the high internal phosphorus load, but the sediment samples do. So this project um, is a applied cooperative research project with USGS Water Science Center, uh, New Jersey Water Science Center, Montclair State University, NJDEP, and the Authority. Um, this is a really highly complex project and there is this is a totally different presentation. There was actually one that was given at the 2022 HAB Summit. So you can go back to learn more about this study um, from last year's videos. Uh, but there are three water bodies in the Raritan Basin upstream of the water purveyor intakes. And that would be Spruce Run Reservoir, Bud Lake Reservoir, and Rosedale Lake on the Millstone watershed that have had confirmed recurrent HABs over the last several years. While we are still in the data analysis process, a few patterns have been uncovered from this study that lead to more questions about the outs of Spruce Run Water Reservoir. Um, Spruce Run Reservoir, um, different than Bud Lake, Bud Lake often has a higher level of cell concentrations or toxins, uh, but Spruce Run Reservoir contributes more loading to the Raritan River than Bud Lake does, and cell transport and algal load um, to the river. And the Millstone River, the other thing we've learned about that is that that actually provides more opportunity for growth. Um, and you learned about Vic's presentation and Bob had mentioned um, that likely due to the consistent source of nutrients um, in the Millstone River. And so while most HAB work is really focused on the input, this study really confirms that the outs of water bodies with HABs should not be ignored either. So we have some upcoming projects to continue this work um, in this investigation and really on the management side of things. Um, and this is a list of three projects that we recently got funded for. Um, so we have an in-depth characterization study of the reservoir and the tributaries to collect more data. 
uh, implementation of agricultural best management practices in the Spruce Run Reservoir watershed, and the installation of a boat cleaning station for aquatic invasive species, which will also protect against HABs as noxious levels of aquatic plants can also affect water quality, alter nutrient cycling, and proliferate HABs. So the moral of the story here is really there's a lot that we don't know yet. Um, about the HABs and spruce run is really a tricky one to figure out. Uh, there are really a lot of factors at play, but both the ins and the outs of the reservoir really do matter. Thank you. Thanks, Heather and Jason and Vic. I mean, those were really um, great presentations showing a diverse uh, range of, of scenarios and, and cases. Does anyone have any questions? They, we have a few minutes. We can have a, a q and I know there's a bunch of chat questions moving, and I know the presenters are working at, at moving them, but if you think um, you would like a more engaging conversation, I think we have a few minutes to take some questions if someone wanted to raise their hand. If not, I can just go back and try to read a couple of them. Um, so Heather, for you, since you just went, um, Fred asked if he's saying maybe the sediments have a lot of iron and or aluminum that helps keep a lot of that bioavailable bound up. Is spruce run polymictic or dimictic? Um, spruce run is dimictic. Um, and I have to, I'll have to look back at the other uh, the other uh, components of the sed the sediment samples um, to really dive into that. So that's a really great uh, thing to look into. Okay, and then Julia asked if the shape of the reservoir is an interesting question. So you know, what does what does that do to to impact tabs? Yeah, I mean, that's something that I always wonder with Spruce Run. It has a lot of shoreline to it, um, and so it's really easy for things to get trapped in the various shorelines. And I think with the way that the watersheds come in, that really is a possibility that we are kind of getting, there's a lot of confusing factors that are happening in the reservoir here. So that that could be, you know, we've got issues, different issues coming in from both watersheds, kind of all mixing together in the pot of the reservoir and kind of getting trapped in that strange shape. Yeah, and definitely makes sense. Um, and then kind of similarly, um, you know, Spruce Run is very responsive to dry weather. Somebody asked if, if you know, it, it often does, does recede quite a bit during dry weather. How does that impact tabs? Have you seen a relationship there? I think, you know, kind of last year uh, when we were much lower, I'll say there, I mean, there's, there's kind of a habit comes and goes. I'll say last year didn't seem to be as influenced as some of the wetter years. Um, when it does rain, we do see that, uh, but it doesn't, I haven't necessarily, we haven't looked enough yet to see if really the the level, the volume of the water in the reservoir is really causing any difference there yet. But I think there really is definitely a rain influence factor uh, for the reservoir as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And with that, we're going to get moving on to our fourth session of the day, our last session of the day. And I think some of our presenters are going to hang on the line a little bit. If you have additional questions for them, feel free to at any time uh, continue to, to put them into the chat. So our last session of the day is getting smarter on HABs. And we will once again have Dr. Jason Adolph, who is going to be giving a readout, readout on the expert team. Jason? Thank you. I'm just getting my slides up. Yep, um, you can see them. You're good. Good to go? Yep. OK. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for having me back. It was a great symposium. Um, and as a member of the um, HAB expert team, I'm going to read out uh, what we accomplished last year and what we're looking forward to um, working on this year. And I think my slides will work in this way right now. Uh, <laughs> I hope so. Um, the the Haven Lake Management Expert Team was um, ten individuals from different backgrounds. I think this is for me as an academic researcher background. It was really interesting to work with what we came to know as lake practitioners, people who do the boots on the on the ground restoration using using data to actually make differences in lakes, as opposed to people like me who 
are more about describing problems. Um, and uh, that was really interesting to me. Work with a, a bunch of smart people doing great things. Um, that in 2022, we worked on two main things I'm going to go through. One is um, the uh, the overall charge questions that had to do with um, pesticide application and uh, lake management issues. Uh, and I'll go through some of those points that that we produced in a document and summarized in a document and also um, water quality monitoring guidance recommendations based on the water quality monitoring data pr provided to us from NJDEP. Um, yeah, this is not working. Can I quickly switch? Uh, well, I'll just say, I don't know how the rest of my slides are going to come up. I do also want to thank Mike Danko from the New Jersey Sea Grant Consortium who helped put this presentation together. Um, and who was kind of our, our administrative leader throughout the time that we worked together. Um, so going back to the, the first section, the overall charge questions, we um, we addressed questions given to us from DEP about um, uh, permitted and non-permitted application of pesticides. Um, the questions had to do with what's what's good and what's best practices, what's recommended and what's not recommend, recommended. And um, there is a document with all these answers in it, and uh, I believe Vic might have just posted that. Is that what you just posted, Vic, in the chat? A link to the document? That's a link to the expert team website, but it also has a link on that website to the resource guide that you're talking about. Great. Um, so in the, the overall, um, thank you. The overall um, recommendations were that um, folks should shy away from quick fixes. Uh, applications of pesticides and herbicides need to be considered in the broader goals and long-term objectives of, of lake management. Um, there were specific questions about um, if there are any uh, applications that could have long-lasting effects, and copper treatment came up as one of those one of those potentially long-term harmful things. Copper will have a, an immediate effect on harmful algal blooms by lysing the cells. But um, one of the things copper doesn't do is inactivate toxins, and it can actually ex cause more exposure of people and, and animals in the lake to toxins after um, treatment by simply lysing the cells and causing the toxin to be released in an unchanged format. Um, there are non-copper algicide alternatives, such as this one listed here, sodium carbonate per oxyhydroxate. And um, this is different in copper that it lyses the cells, but it also uh, oxidizes toxins that would be released inactivating them. And the, 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 that's the advantage of this, but the drawback would be that it's more expensive. Um, there were questions about whether there are, um, uh, there's incompat incompatibility among different management measures that might be tried, such as application of herbicides uh, and pesticides with nutrient deactivators and, and uh, weed harvesting practices. And uh, to, to summarize what's in the document, yes, there are lots of potential uh, incompatibilities between things. Uh, for instance, um, uh, hydro raking practices should be uh, separate from applications of nutrient inactivators because they have a uh, uh, the the rate the sediment disturbance will um, limit the applicability or, or the efficacy of the nutrient in inactivators. But there are uh, a number of other examples in that document about different incompatible um, management practices that can be easily avoided if if you know what you're, you're talking about. Um, the uh, coordination of pesticide applications on, on bigger lakes among uh, lake advocacy groups, homeowners associations, and consultants working on lakes was recommended, as well as thinking about the timing of the treatment delivery, which is going to be a lake-to-lake -lake basis. Um, and that point goes to a, a broader point that we talked about a lot on the team. Um, as we looked at the New Jersey lakes and the data and talked amongst ourselves, we realized that uh, one of the overarching themes of what we were doing and that we want everyone to understand is that uh, a lot of these things, whether, whether it's a restoration strategy, um, 
have to be considered on a lake to lake basis. There's no one solution that's going to be uh, appropriate for every lake in New Jersey. And there might be a different solution for almost every lake in New Jersey. Uh, we also considered weed harvesting best practices, timing best practices, uh, recommending that late season weed, weed harvesting is, is the best if the goal is to remo remove nutrients. And you can understand that in terms of if you give this, the, the plants the, the season to take up inorganic nutrients into plant biomass and then remove that plant biomass, you're effectively removing the nutrients from the lake. You can't rake dissolved nutrients, in other words. Um, and the, the, uh, the, the timing is important, as well as uh, putting together the, our community monitoring program for the, the, uh, the uh, plants and weeds that are in a lake. We talked about uh, lake winter drawdowns that are per, uh, permitted by the DP, and um, that conversation ended up in thinking about how um, we really need to understand how that affects the, the, the lakes within the seasonal cycle of um, that the lakes experience and, and go through, including HAB and other water quality changes that happen over, over different seasons. Um, okay, now, it's, oh, this is gonna work, oh, good. So, so then moving on to the, the other document that we worked on about water quality monitoring guidance. Um, we worked on this as a team. We broke into different um, sections of the team and took different data sets and evaluated them against some questions that were given to us by NJDEP staff. Then we held a, 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 a um, question and answer session with um, key staff members. So the overall recommendation that everyone on the team agreed with was that it would behoove the state to move from uh, a reactive kind of sampling, which Vic mentioned is, is part and parcel of being a regulatory agency, to being a more proactive agency that the samples has, for instance, when they're not present and just, just year round. And understanding that that's more of a research stance than a regulatory agency stance. Um, but for the things we wanna know about HABs in New Jersey, that's really the necessary kind of data that, that we need. Um, so this graph here is cell count and toxin data from the DEP data set. And you'll notice that the samples aren't present between the HAB seasons. They're mostly just during the HAB seasons, but to understand how this happened, you really want to know what's going on here as well as what's going on here. Um, the, the need for more targeted vertical profile um, samples was identified, and this is a, um, a tool that Bob Cortman from the team uh, showed us all that he uses in his consulting business that just uh, allows them to take vertically profile data, in this case is water, water quality data, and compute metrics that tell us more about the lake than just simple surface sampling. The lakes I work in are three to six feet deep, so I don't have that issue, but um, I do understand from my oceanographic side that the three-dimensional structure of lakes and the ocean is critical um, to understanding what's going on. Uh, as a team, we looked at a bunch of data. Uh, uh, this is from uh, Ling Ren. She looked at uh, total phosphorus and total nitrogen relationships to chlorophyll A, an indicator of trophic state of the lakes, um, looking at how our lakes stack up versus uh, well-established indicators for both chlorophyll and uh, total at nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, Nathan Rule and I did principal components analysis, and the upshot of these were that, um, like I was saying earlier in my presentation, within a lake, there's a lot of variability station to station. So not only can we not have a, a, a common solution lake to lake, but station to station within a lake can be almost as variable at times. Uh, Nicole Fahrenfeld from Rutgers led us through a, a, a nice machine learning model using, using DEP data that looked for um, how much of the variability in HABs and HAB toxin was explained by the different things that are measured here. And I don't need to go into the details or anything, but um, this, of all the models that we tried, was one of the more successful in explaining the patterns and the data that, that we were, were given. And it's machine learning, so it's totally cool. 
Uh, and then I did some work with the water quality buoys, um, doing some time series analysis and time series modeling. And um, to me, I think that the time series data and the buoys are really important if they're couched within uh, an, an integrated program. And I will say that at today's meeting, I'm very happy to see uh, a lot of these recommendations that we were talking about are, are being implemented in the NJDEP HAB monitoring program. Uh, on the uh, community composition data, so um, folks from Montclair, Mayan Wu, and uh, other people led the analysis of the, the cyanobacterial community co composition data, and again concluded that you really need the depth of resolution of these, these data to understand what's going on because sometimes the bloom comes out of nowhere because it comes from the bottom of, of the lake to the top of the lake. Um, again, identifying the need for year round sampling. And um, the state counts cells as a regulatory metric and records a dominant taxa, but this limits the utility of the data for doing community scale analyses. Um, and then finally, we, we recommended. Um, that the state, and I know the state is doing this, consider using genomics approaches to get at cyanobacterial community analysis. There's a whole bunch of technology out there now that allows you to look at genes floating around in the lakes and use that to identify what kinds of cyanobacteria are there and what kinds of toxin genes are there as well. Then of course, um, to continue long-term monitoring um, in the context of understanding how, on top of everything else that's going on in the state, how climate change is going to exacerbate um, or otherwise affect our cycle of harmful algal blooms. Well, we're up for next, and we haven't started yet, so this is kind of news to me also. Uh, uh, guidance for developing a HAB prevention, mitigation, and management plan. Um, and hosting training events focused on HAP prevention, mitigation, and management. So I'm looking forward to that. I thank all my DP collaborators and team collaborators, and uh, we'll try to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Um, does anyone have any questions for Jason right now? Otherwise, we can jump to our last presenters of the day. And then we can have a, a few minutes for question and answer afterward. So today we have a joint presentation from the New Jersey Department of Agriculture. We have Sarah Mahmood, who is responsible for the One New Jersey One Health Task Force, and Dr. Christine Hernandez, an Eagleton Fellow, both who will be presenting on One Health, uh, Habs, and Agriculture. And I can see your screen. You guys are good to go. Wonderful, thank you. So what is One Health? Um, One Health is not a new concept, but it has become increasingly important in recent years. Um, the CDC defines One Health as a collaborative, multi-sectorial, and transdisciplinary approach that works at the local, regional, national, and global levels with the goal of achieving optimal health outcomes that recognizes the interconnection between people, animals, plants, and their shared environment. So in the United States, the CDC is home to the One Health Office, um, guiding and encouraging One Health practices. So utilizing One Health, uh, the One Health approach is increasingly important due to many factors that have changed the interactions between people, animals, plants, and our shared environments. So I'd like to highlight three. Um, the first is population increase and geographical expansion. So as a result, people are living in closer proximity to each other and with wild and domestic animals. Second is the movement of people, animals, and agricultural plants. Um, international trade and uh, travel are aggregators that rap rapidly increase uh, disease transmission globally, as we saw with COVID-19. And lastly, climate change, um, disruptions in environmental conditions. Um, so changes in our environment can cause disruptions in wildlife habitats and the climate that makes issues like HABs more frequent. So these are factors that are important to consider um, to optimize public health. 
So One Health in New Jersey. Uh, Governor Murphy signed a groundbreaking bill establishing the New Jersey One Health Task Force in the Department of Agriculture, making New Jersey the first state in the nation to legislate a One Health initiative to study, prepare for, and respond to instances where health concerns cross the barriers of human, animal, and environmental health. Uh, so the purpose of the task force is to develop strategic plans uh, to promote interdisciplinary communication and collaboration um, among physicians, vets, scientific professionals, stakeholders, as well as state and federal agencies. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary effort with the Departments of Health and Environmental Protection as leading collaborators, with each department having their own designee. So three designees, along with 10 public, publicly appointed members of varying expertise, are called to devise One Health program recommendations and research efforts that overall serve to protect the health of New Jersey residents, animals, and our natural resources. So HOPS is a One Health issue. It can affect crop safety, animal health, and lead to economic impacts. So in almost all agricultural practices, uh, growing fresh produce, aquaculture, and raising livestock needs safe fresh water. However, more than 40% of lakes and reservoirs worldwide are now eutrophic and offer favorable conditions for cyanobacterial mass development. So there are very few studies that have been conducted to investigate whether and how the water containing cyanobacteria and their toxin influence food safety. So therefore, there's an urgent research need to determine the fate and accumulation of cyanotoxins in fresh produce and its treatment strategy. So first, crop safety. Uh, Dr. G. Lee from Ohio State University uh, published findings from a research project investigating, among other objectives, whether toxins accumulate in plants when the irrigation water contains toxins and harmful cyanobacteria. So it was found that 50% of toxin containing water accumulated in soil and the rest of the toxin ended up in fresh produce. However, the extent of the accumulation is different depending on crop type. In this instance, lettuce, carrots, and green beans were tested and the accumulated toxins were in the edible parts of the crops for lettuce and carrots they showed moderate to high risk for both children and adult populations. It was also clear that crops showed negative food quality. Next is animal health. Um, livestock and other animals, including your companion animal, can suffer severe illness or death after ingesting toxins from cyanobacterial blooms. Um, animals are often exposed by drinking contaminated water, uh, swallowing water while swimming, or licking cyanobacteria from their fur. And lastly is economic impacts. So we know that cyanotoxins can bioaccumulate in different animal species and crops, and therefore habitants have the potential to massively disrupt economical and agricultural endeavors. Um, for example, in April of 2021, Chile experienced a hab event that killed roughly 5,000 tons of salmon, costing a loss of over $25 million. Moreover, if water becomes contaminated, farmers will have to look for outside resources in order to feed their livestock and uh, water their crops. I'd like to take a moment to highlight uh, the CDC's One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System. Uh, this is a voluntary reporting system available to state and territorial public health departments, as well as their environmental or animal health partners. Um, the One Health HAB system is an event-based reporting system for HAB and associated individual and animal cases of illness. So it's not a real-time notification or case investigation system. Um, this system collects data on human illnesses, animal Ill illnesses, and environmental data um, caused by HABs. Um, this system can help describe how many people and animals become sick from HABs each year, symptoms of illnesses caused by HABs, and where HABs and illnesses are occurring in the United States. So they have some resources on, the, on their page, which I've listed here, and you can do a quick search as well, um, where they have uh, resources and summary reports. So I encourage all of you to check it out.
So in order to help our ag community better manage and prevent HAB events, I've researched a few recommendations that could be beneficial, but also still provide a broader application. So our first recommendation is to test the soil for nutrient levels prior to fertilization. About 80% of nitrogen fertilizers applied to fields is actually lost in runoff. So the idea would be to minimize excess use of fertilizers by limiting when and how much can be used at any given time. Therefore, testing the soil could save money and time to the farmers, but also limit excess nutrients in the soil leading to best management practices. Our second recommendation is to plant trees and vegetation as barrier methods in strategic locations where farming land meets waterways. You can consider this as a type of natural fencing to protect the edges of an area that is highly affected by runoff. Examples of this could be coconut fibers or different species of grasses. Uh, our next recommendation is to use lining to protect the soil and or um, waterways. So first you can line your manure piles and this allows the protection of the soil from being contaminated from your manure pile. But you can also line watering holes to prevent soil leaching into the water. This helps prevent leaching and contamination as excess elements and nutrients can remain for extended amounts of time within the soil. This recommendation includes um, uh, remediation options. So for example, phosphorus traps, which you can see um, on the upper right-hand corner, they're built to direct runoff to specific locations where absorption facilities can be waiting to filter nutrients out of the water. You can use steel shavings and gravel, for example, and lead to clean water being released on the other end. You can also utilize flocculating agents, which can include substances such as clay or treatment with barley straw. This is um, a system in which the cyanobacteria cells kind of coagulate together, as you see on the bottom right corner. Consider it net-like, um, causing the, the cells to fall to the bottom of, of the waterway and clearing the water column. An interesting concept to consider is utilizing the wetlands of New Jersey, designated here in lime green as another natural filtering system. You can see that HAB events are sprinkled throughout the area where wetlands are present. Therefore, restoring wetlands to provide natural filtration systems can be an effective way to utilize um, their, their benefit. For example, Ohio invested around 90 million to restore, enlarge, and construct wetlands, and this led to 90% of their phosphorus being removed from waterways. Um, and finally, although it seems easy enough, monitoring programs such uh, monitoring programs can be extremely useful, especially in locations that have repeated HAB events, and as uh, the previous uh, presentation mentioned, uh, longer monitoring periods as well. And then finally, some interesting concepts to consider for controlling HABs in the future include algal cultivation and harvesting for use in fuels and bioplastics, as well as algal turf scrubbers, which actually utilize the algae itself to feed off of the excess nutrients in the water, therefore removing them. However, these can be expensive endeavors and, could re and would require consistent and large HABs in order to make these investments cost effective. In addition, it would also require a change in mindset to a more circular infrastructure mentality where waste is now seen as something usable and profitable. But these are options and they can be effective under the right conditions. So in conclusion, um, HAB events are a One Health issue that affects humans, animals, plants, and our shared environments. And although there are minimal options right now for remediation, um, it's important for us to prioritize um, preventative and proactive measures. Thank you. So, yeah, thanks. And if you have any questions, our, um, our info is right there. Please reach out to us. Thanks, guys. Um, we do have a question for you in the chat. Um, do you know of any documented cases where a number of livestock or poultry were impacted or killed by consuming cyanotoxins? Are you spe specifying to New Jersey? Ah, uh, it doesn't say New Jersey, but I, I'm I'm, I'm assuming that's what we're or, talking or about. But. Right, the other. Yeah. I have seen cases of like um, 
as um, Sarah mentioned, there was a die off of, of salmon. So it tends to be um, fish or shellfish becoming too toxic to eat. Uh, cases like that do exist. Um, in terms of people dying, that tends to be on the lower end. Actually, if you go on to the one help, um, harmful algal bloom site um, from the CDC that I mentioned earlier, they do have uh, national statistics on human, and animal, and environmental um, stats. So there are um, recorded instances of people reporting deaths related to cyanobacteria. So they have some more in-depth um, sources if you want to check that out. Thank you. All right, uh, at this point, thank you guys very much. Um, we'll open up the floor for a few minutes if anybody has any questions for um, for Sarah or Christina or Jason. Okay, oh, we got quite a few going. Oh, Jason has a question for himself. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Jason. <laughs> Uh, I do have a question. How do I lower my hand? Oh, there it is. I had a question for Christina and Sarah, actually. Uh, your comment about wetlands in places like where I work, where there isn't necessarily room to expand wetlands, how effective are things like loading wetlands and living shorelines in replicating the function of, of wetlands? In, in terms of preventing HABs, I haven't looked into that specific um, angle, but I know that living shorelines do tend to be effective for, uh, for example, protecting the shoreline uh, more so than hard, uh, hard structures. So it could have like a double benefit. And I know New Jersey is already trying to create more living shorelines. So it would definitely be something to look into further to see if we can provide a dual function there. Hey, uh, Thank you. Jason, um, one other thing is if you look at, um, if you're interested in floating wetland islands, um, the Chesapeake Bay Stormwater Manual has a good section on floating wetland islands, and they, they recommend putting them in existing wet BMPs um, because you can get a decent amount of coverage and it really helps to enhance the nutrient removal rate. But that's, with the Chesapeake, that's what they're really focusing on, putting them in existing uh, structures. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking about the scale of how many floating wetlands you can put in a lake versus wetland areas surrounding a lake and, and the relative water filtration benefits you get from, from each. I just I just yeah. don't know about that. Yeah, and that's why they focus on existing BMPs because you know it could be anywhere between one to fifteen percent of the surface coverage. And you can get that with a stormwater BMP, but you're not going to get that for a lake. Um where we use the floating wetland islands and lakes. We like to position them in front of like a stormwater swale or pipe. So it's getting that first flush. But yeah, I mean, you're we use the floating wetland islands as sort of like polishing a, a number, a, another tool in the tool belt, but it's not gonna, it's not a magic bullet. It's not gonna take care of you know the whole situation. Where where is the magic bullet, Fred? <laughs> I think that's what we're all looking for. <laughs> Thank you. And wasn't that in session too? <laughs> so, all right. So, Fred, do you have um, an additional question, or you guys, you, you, you wanted to have your conversation with Jason? Yeah, no, I, just, I didn't. Just, I didn't want to cut you off without. If no, you had thank another you. Question. I appreciate that. I uh, just had another quick question um, for the last two presenters, uh, for Sarah and Christine. I, I really enjoyed the presentation. I was just curious if you've had any experience with the use of biochar. Um, for ag, um, we started using biochar to remove nutrients, uh, again, from stormwater ponds and beach areas, but I, I see Pennsylvania um, is, is starting to advocate using biochar in green infrastructure, in, in rain gardens and stuff like that. So I was just curious if either of you could talk about that. I just learned about biochar in general, so I'm not sure about its applications in agriculture currently. Um, but I do think that it's definitely something that is being talked about in the department as an option. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I do not see any more hands. So with that, I would like to turn this over to our Assistant Commissioner for Water Resource Management, Pat Gardner. And I will present your slide. <laughs> One second. <laughs> Okay. 
Um, good afternoon, and I want to thank everyone for attending today's summit. Um, you know, my hope is that you're going to walk away from today's summit having learned something new, you know, met new colleagues that you might intend to work with. And, and most importantly, your interest is piqued on what challenge might be coming next and are already thinking about possible next steps and solution. I also want to send out a very special thanks to all the presenters and the work group who put today's summit together. And as been discussed already in 2022, we were met with some new challenges. You know, the increase in the occurrence and severity of, and also the impacts uh, to several drinking water systems. And as Assistant Commissioner Angarone stated earlier this morning, we were in such a better place to address these new challenges because of all the work that came before um, by all of you over the last few years. Um, the collaborations that we developed over the past few years, the fact that we knew experts to reach out to throughout the country was really instrumental in a successful outcome. And it's great to see all the advancements that are being made in monitoring analytical and treatment technologies, as well as outreach and engagement efforts. And I think it's also been mentioned several times today, like we all recognize that it's time for a change in the approach. You know, continue our efforts to bring all interested parties together to educate, plan, embrace opportunities, develop data-driven science and policy, and to implement holistic solutions. <clears throat> so while you're sitting there today, you may be thinking like, what does this slide have to do with today's summit? But I think if you're like me, like each of us comes to this work for a certain reason. And one of mine is that I have a very strong connection to the Jersey Shore and Barnegat Bay, having spent a large portion of my life living, working, and visiting it. And currently I live in Tom's River. So this, this slide shows several photos that I took from my street. You know, I live on a lagoon community. I mean, I don't have it. I'm actually, my house is across the street from the lagoon, so I don't have my own lagoon. But like, if you look at that, I, when you go down to the end of my street, it's where the Toms River meets Barnegat Bay. Um, and it's just, it's such a wonderful place to live. Um, and last year, I became a grandparent for the first time. So the photos also feature a little swimmer it's my grandson, Maddie. So all the work we do to improve or maintain water quality in New Jersey is challenging. It can be frustrating, overwhelming, and at times downright scary. So it helps me to remember why I do it. I continue to move forward to protect public health and the environment for all New Jerseyans, including Maddie. I also take comfort that there are dedicated individuals like yourselves and many others with the same goal. So thank you again for attending the summit, sharing your work and ideas, and for your continued efforts to protect New Jersey's water quality. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And thanks again, everybody, for coming. Again, just to reiterate, uh, this presentation video will be posted on our website as well as the slides. So thank you for coming and have a great day.